No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. This one is about um, pro standards. <clears throat> now, uh, several of you have been in my classes before. You know, it's kind of interesting how everything has changed. I used to come down there in person. We'd spend four or five hours going through all this stuff. Now, everything's by Zoom. We used to have our lunch catered. So just for your edification, during the lunch period of time, the half an hour period of time, so it's, it's a four-hour class, includes the lunch. The lunch will be included, but you're going to have to provide it yourselves. So it's a three-and-a-half-hour class because we always have lunch. We talk about things. We have what we call a working lunch. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is I'm going to uh, – the it's become apparent that some people do not think that the code of ethics is worth taking – and so have quit the association based on that. Well, every three years, and you just did this, in order to be a member of Tulare County, you had to have taken a two and a half hour ethics class. You basically had half of this one because we talk about the code of ethics, the um, uh, the three standing committees, Grievance Committee, Pro Standards Committee, Arbitration Committee. So let me tell you who I am. My name is Joel Carlson. This is my contact information. Feel free to get in touch with me. Uh, talk to me about different things. We have to redact that. You know, if you're sitting, I'm on a panel and I got this thing and I'm trying to figure it out. Redact out the names. Give me the situation and we'll we'll discuss it. And we're going to do something a little different this year. Um we're going to do some moot court. Um, I'm going to go over the required materials for every two years you have to take. And then we're going to go over an area that I don't know, uh, you should know about. If you don't know about, I'm going to make sure you know about it. And then some of the things that have gone on there. I am a owner broker of MJC Realty. I my office. I have three offices, one in Newport Beach, one in Huntington Beach, and one in Seal Beach. I like the beach. I am also a master instructor with the California Association of Realtors. Um, I bought this particular class from them in 1996 when they decided we're not going to do training anymore. <clears throat> and I've been teaching it to the different associations since then. Uh, I am a designated instructor from the National Association. I used to travel all around the country to talk about real estate. Now everything is Zoom. I miss all the great scenery and the great meals, but such as that. And I'm also a certified real estate consultant from the American College. I just wrote alphabet soup after my name. So I went ahead and got another designation. Um, actually, the reason I got that particular designation is when I'm working with buyers. Well, wait a minute, let me ask you a question. How many of you have ever dealt with a buyer, showed them everything in the multiple listing and they bought through somebody else? Y'all been in the business more than 15 minutes? Well, after that happened a number of times, I said, you know what? The next time somebody wants to pick my brain and waste my time, I'm going to charge them. Just like any other real estate professional would. You see, I call you real estate professionals because you are defined as such under our state constitution. Yeah, believe it or not, we got a constitution here in California. It was codified in 1879. It says, if you have a state-issued license, that's the DRE, and a requirement of continuing education, that's 45 hours every four years, you are considered a professional. As professionals, are we held to a higher standard? Absolutely. Well, if I'm held to that higher standard, I want to be compensated at that higher standard. So my office policy at MJC Realty is you walk into my office, say, hi, I want to buy real estate. I say, terrific. The first half hour is free. After that, you either sign a buyer representation agreement or a fee agreement. If you won't do that, don't let the door hit you on the way out. You see, I've gotten old and grumpy. I don't have to put up with the boneheads anymore. Now, this brings me to my three caveats. A caveat is a promise to do or not to do something. All I'm going to talk to you about here today are one to four residential units. <clears throat> one to four. And the laws that are ancillary to those. 
and the cases that we come up with on those. Because that's basically about 90% of what we're, we're doing here at the California Association of Realtors. My second caveat is I will tell you what those laws are. In other words, they're business and professions code, civil code, or commissioner's regulations. Now, you know, well, you will know by the end of this class, we do not determine if it was a legal situation in the grievance committee, pro standards committee. That's not our purview. That's the Department of Real Estate's purview. But oftentimes you need to know what those are so that you can say, ah, we're not hearing this. This is going to DRE. My last caveat is the most important, and that is it doesn't matter what I say here. It matters what your broker says, because your broker is ultimately liable for whatever you do under 10131 of the Business and Professor Code. Now, I know you say, well, Joel, I am the broker. And that I am particularly proud of because most of the people who take their time, they, this is their career, this is what they've been doing, they take their time to volunteer in these committees and they're brokers. And I appreciate that. And I've spent many of my years uh, doing that also. All right, let's see here. So crafting discipline. Now, this was prepared in 1995, uh, 2015. Nothing's really changed in it. What they did is they became a kinder, gentler um, professional standards. Okay, that's fine. But some things have come up we're gonna be discussing today where we're no more Mr. Nice Guy. So realtors are wrongly or charged unethical conduct, professional, they, they get a personal vindic vindication. In other words, somebody says to you, well, you violated the Code of Ethics, Board Bylaws, Association Bylaws, or the MLS Bylaws, and they're found out that they didn't. They can put out a, a thing saying, hi, I was accused of this and I didn't do it. <clears throat> so we have that ability now. And where the violations determined the hearing process educates members. This is what they want now. They want us to be educated. And I see this as being more prevalent based on the fact that we now have a standards of practice 1-7 in our purchase agreement. And we'll talk more about that. That's our first uh, article, Article 1. Basically, Article 1 says you won't say bad things about other realtors. It used to say you will not disparage other realtors, but Nobody knew what that meant. So now it says you won't say bad things. <clears throat> the, uh, the caution is the, the rights of the parties to be observed. And we're not a court of law, but we, we work through that kind of venue. So we have to make sure that we preserve the rights and due diligence or due, due process so that we, as members of the association, and when it says boards, it means your board of directors um, so that we can eliminate some of that problem where the people say, you messed up, I'm coming after you. As a matter of fact, they now have an insurance called D&O insurance. You, you've heard of E&O insurance, errors and emissions. Now they have D&O insurance, directors and officers insurance. So in case there is somebody who sues you, has a, a situation against you, you're covered. So the code's duties becomes aspirational at best. And, you know, it's, these are the things, this is the law we know under 10176, 10177. If you do this in the state of California, you're going to lose your license and be sanctioned. The Code of Ethics is over 50 United States, and it's based on years and years and years of this is probably the right thing to do. So um, if not enforced, and then with vigor and determination, it'll go on. I'm always reminded of the quote, and I don't know where it comes from, but it says, when good men and women do nothing, evil will triumph. So with that in mind, we've gone over the code of ethics. I mean, you had to have had this in the last two years, uh, three years, because <clears throat> that was part of it. We're going to, I'm going to make sure that you understand there's 17 articles in the code of ethics, one through nine has to do with your clients and customers. And we're going to talk about Article 1 uh, and standard practice 1-7. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the Articles 4, 10 through 14 covers the public. The biggest change in there is Article 10. So we will talk about that in the addition to the purchase agreement. And then Articles 15, 16, and 17 are the ones we're going to spend the most of the time on. Because these are duties to other realtors. <clears throat> So stands of practice is also underneath there. Now, the, the MLS bylaws, what's interesting to me is 
in, in where I am in Southern California, there are five multiple listing services. You could belong to five different MLSs. So with that in mind, you need whatever one you're in, you need to know the bylaws for that. So you need to get a copy of that. Now, we have as realtors said, look, we're pretty busy here. Most of these violations are little things. So we're going to let the MLS mete out fines. Now, I don't know if your associate or your particular MLS does that, but if you're, if you don't put it in there within the period of time, you get a fine. If you And we don't even have to sit for that. We just, that's just the fine. You know it as a MLS member when you get it. If it's larger than a certain amount, then maybe it's going to have to go through a grievance committee and pro standards committee. We'll talk more about that. Then we get down to the model rules. This is from the California Association of Realtors. This was handed to us by NAR. NAR then <clears throat> gave it to CAR. CAR massaged it for California. Then they gave it to our local associations. <clears throat> so our local associations have a set of model bylaws. And then the MLSs that we use have to adhere to that. And then they put their little things into there so that it makes sense to them. All right, participation and authorization. This is where it's getting a little hinky. And the reason I say that is because we had a decision through the DOJ from the National Association or the Department of Justice said the, um, the National Association of Realtors is a monopoly. And so they wanted certain things changed. The National Realtor said, what? I'm gonna, what do you want changed? And they said, this, 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 and this. And they said, fine. And agreed to it and came to an agreement last uh, 2021. Yeah. Earlier in that year. Well, the Department of Justice, you know, it's like one of those things. You ever had a situation <clears throat> where the seller says, I want to list my home. You say, okay. So you say, this is the comparables in the area. You say, I want to list a little higher. So this is a little higher. You know, I, I'm not talking about this market. This market is absolutely insane. I'm talking to just whatever normal is a normal market. So you list it a little high and an offer comes in at the list price and the seller goes, I didn't ask enough. Well, that's what I think happened with the Department of Justice. They made this agreement with the National Association of Realtors. It was signed by everybody that has meaning in our government. And in October, they said, nah, October, 2021, nah, we're not gonna adhere to this. At this moment in time, we don't have any direction. So I'm gonna go over those four elements that we agreed to in 2021 that the Department of Justice is now reneged on. And this is unprecedented. You go through the annual annuals of our nation. There has never been an agreement where they have done this. So this is like brand new. Nobody even knows how to work with it. So I'm going to talk to you about participation and authorization because it has two of the elements that have to do with your MLS. Uh, regional and reciprocal agreements. This is where we on a committee have to be careful of because we have our rules and regs at our MLS. And if there's a reciprocal, we have to know what the rules and regs on that MLS are. Now, they're not going to be that much different, but we still have to take that into consideration when we're sitting down and saying, hi, how you doing? Uh, listen, you're in violation of MLS bylaws. Well, that's our bylaws. What about their bylaws? If it's a reciprocal. And then listing procedures, when the listing has to be put in, what information has to be on there, minimal, <clears throat> and then documentation. I remember when I joined the association, excuse me. When I got my real estate license, you had to submit your, your listing agreement to show that you really had a listing on the property. That was 1976. <clears throat> now, we're all ethical. <laughs> and we have said we have a listing agreement. Now, it's come to, come, it's come to our attention <clears throat> at the state level Department of Real Estate that some of these agents don't have a listing agreement. Suffice to say, our code of ethics require that. And it should be in writing based on the fact that it's not enforceable in a court of law unless it is in writing. 
So, and the accuracy of the information. Now we've gone to great lengths to say what we do as real estate professionals. And I'm gonna go over that in our RPA as well as in our statewide buyer and seller advisory, because that becomes incumbent upon us. I don't care what you're doing, if you're on the committees or not, making a living here in the state of California selling real estate. All right, then reporting sales and other information. So this is MLS bylaws what has to be done. And so if we're sitting on a tribunal and there's a violation, we have to know what these things are. So that's why the Professional Standards Committee, I uh, remember taking my training and we learned about code of ethics. Okay, that was pretty simple. But the bylaws for the association or board was very complicated or not complicated, just a lot. And to understand <clears throat> most of it in legalese, <clears throat> And then the bylaws for the multiple listing service. Now, it was simple when we had our own multiple listing services. We, we had a division of church and state in the 1970s when they said, you as, an, as a board of realtors cannot own the MLS because that's a monopoly, if you will, that it has to be separated. <clears throat> and so I can join the board association and not be a member of the MLS, or I can join the MLS and not be a member of the association. That was a court case in California. Um, there are prohibits, uh, prohibitions and requirements. We're gonna go over those. There's also violations. Now the violations vary per your MLS. So, but there are certain things where the professional standards committee will be able to say you member have violated these bylaws, you are out. We're kicking you out of our MLS. A procedure for the hearing. So we'll, we'll talk about those procedures. And again, we pushed a lot of this to the MLS. Well, in my particular area, I'm not sure about to Larry. So we pushed a lot of it to our MLS and let them do $100 fine, $200 fine, $250 fine, those kinds of things. All right, then we get to the association bylaws. Now, this was the one, remember when you joined the association, they gave you a copy of these? <coughs> well, they may have given you a link now. And you were to go over them and memorize them. <laughs> well, that was, that was like what, what I got from that when I sat down and I, I belonged to four associations. I belonged to the Newport Beach Association of Realtors, the Orange County Realtors, the Pacific West Association of Realtors, and the Realtors Commercial Alliance. Um, my agents want to belong to these different associations, so I'm fine with that. But I learn a little bit from each one of them, and each one of them treats the MLS a little bit different, and each one of them have different bylaws. Now, there are model bylaws that come from NAR to CAR, CAR to association. Those never change, <clears throat> theoretically. And those model bylaws uh, are articles. These are the articles in those model bylaws. Um, however, I never read them when I joined the association. I didn't read them until I became on a committee, on the Professional Standards Committee. Actually, when I got to the Grievance Committee, we, I spent two years learning about the bylaws and the, the MLS bylaws, the board bylaws, and the Code of Ethics before I even sat on a panel. Now, that was not required. It was just that um, I didn't get picked on a panel. <laughs> so I got that time to learn. We met once a month. The uh, adopted by your board of directors and the enforcement is through your board of directors. The membership in the association is predicated based on you have to have certain criteria. Number one is you have to have a real estate license. You can be a member, it's an affiliate member without a real estate license in certain circumstances. We have that breakdown. And then the privileges, to be a member of your association is a privilege. It's not a, it's not a right, it's a privilege. And you have certain duties on the behalf on that to make sure that you're doing the correct thing. So with that in mind, examples of marketing. So we got an advertising situation. <clears throat> the advertising situation is there's no name on the sign. There's a sign up there that says for sale, has a telephone number on it. Everybody knows that is a real estate company in the area. That's a violation of the code of ethics. It's also a violation of law. 
<laughs> okay, so a lot of our code of ethics are already covered by the law. <clears throat> so first of all, it's going to be taken care of by a legal situation. We're not going to hear it. Secondly, if it is, you know, if they're doing something else, like in the state of California, under the advertising laws, you can put an agent or broker on your sign. It can be even abbreviated AGT for agent and BKR for broker. If you're a realtor, though, you have to put on the name of the company and the term realtor. That's what it says. We nobody does that, but that's basically what your bylaws say. In solicitation, if the property is already listed and they're sending out a postcard saying, hi, if you want to list your property, contact me. Now, this is a common violation and typically it never hits the professional standards unless there's, uh, I, I, in all my years, I've never seen one. I get these postcards all the time. I call up the agent. I say, hi, are you the listing agent on all of these that you've listed? No. Did you sell these? No. Then your bylaws say, your MLS bylaws say, you must put in the name of the listing agent and the name of the sales agent. Now, every time I do this, I always get, well, why would I you know, advertise for somebody else? Because it's the MLS rules and it's part of your marketing rules. Uh, it's one of those... I just got one from Esther the other day, and it's like, Esther, you've been in the business longer than dirt. You know this is not right. Well, what had happened was she just said, I want to send this out. The advertising company took care of it, pulled up all the different listings that were out there and sales and put them onto this postcard and sent it out. She hadn't even approved it. That's how we get ourselves in trouble. You need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. So if the property is already listed, you need to have something on your solicitation that says, if your property is already listed, this is a general advertisement. Please forgive us. We're not trying to solicit your home for, for lease. And then an example of a listing, no signed listing agreement. Now, again, this is one of those where it's like, what? Even as, even as a, a rookie, I knew better than this. But with COVID, we're seeing more and more cases at the Department of Real Estate where they go and they put a sign on it, put a lockbox on it. They have a, somebody dies in the house. They, you know, people come and clear it out. <clears throat> Nobody knows who owns it. So the realtor goes out there, purportedly realtor, puts a sign up, puts a lockbox, changes the lock and starts showing the property for sale without a listing agreement. Based on the fact, maybe somebody promised them. Well, we know in the state of California, if it's not in writing, it ain't enforceable in a court of law. Um, example, selling agent. No disclosure of dual agency. Now this is becoming a biggie. <clears throat> we know better than not to. Well, you would think we know better than not to uh, not to disclose dual agency. However, it is amazing to me how many times it comes up. The seller understood that that agent was their agent, and the buyer thought that they were their agent. Now, whether they were or not, the implication was. That's what your clients think. That's why it's very clear now. We got, we got two forms, one from, the, from Sacramento, given to us in 1988, called the Agency Disclosure Three-Step Process, Disclose, Elect, and Confirm, and then the representation of more than one buyer and seller. This was put together by our legal staff, and it ties into um, 2079 of the Civil Code. So it's a disclosure, but it's not... It's a reiteration of the agency law because there was some questions as to how things work. And we're going to go over that. Somebody asked me, when are we going to take a break, Joel? That's a good question. Three and a half hour class. We'll probably take a break um, about every 50 minutes, 55 minutes. So as we go along here, you know, if somebody says, Joel, my brain is full. Can we take a break? Fine. I'm, I'm good with that. <clears throat> Uh, this is just one of those classes you have to take in order to sit on the committees. I've already given you your accolades based on the fact that you take your time and volunteer your time to be on these committees. And, you know, the reason I do is because I know if I don't volunteer my time to be on these committees, the government will volunteer their time. 
Well, I don't know about you, but I got enough government in my life. I'm just glad I don't get all the government I pay for. So non-disclosure of dual agent, we'll talk about that. So um, authorized disciplines, let's see, are a letter of warning up to three years, a letter of reprimand for three years. I'm gonna tell you about some of the, the panels. I can, uh, because I belong to four associations, there, I don't, I'm not talking out of school here, but I'll let you know about some of the, the things that came up that were rather interesting, not from a violation standpoint, but by a voluntary, okay, I messed up, I'm willing to take the beating. Uh, that's very unusual for, for my aspect. Uh, letter of reprimand for up to three years. So warning and reprimand, then requirement of ethics training. This is typically, you violate the code of ethics and you're found guilty, you're going to take an ethics class. I just took one last week. You're going to take another one because you ain't getting it. Uh, reasonable fines, up to 15,000 bucks. Oops, sorry, right here. <clears throat> up to $15,000. Things can exchange it. Suspension of membership in the MLS if you violated the MLS and, or, or expulsion. And the same with the Board of Realtors. All right. So a letter from the association president responding. Da, da, da. So now as president, <clears throat> you don't think about these things. Nobody tells you, oh, yeah, you got to write a letter, you know, that says this. Ooh. So and that goes in the file, stays there three years. A letter from the association president responded advising for lack of professional conduct uh, due to due process. Okay, and then a letter from the president of the association. So you're the elected official as president of the association. So in the bylaws, it says you have the right to do this. And then the professional conduct due process. And this is one of the areas where we have to be very careful. In our situation right now, we are not a court of law. The, the professional standards committee, the grievance committee, I mean, the uh, Professional Standards Committee and the Arbitration Committee are not a court of law, but we have the same responsibilities under the Constitution from the United States as well as California for due process. And if there's any complaint that I see more often than not, it is I wasn't given due process. So we're going to go over that, make sure we don't violate that one. And the fine commensurate with the gravity of the term into violation, up to $15,000 per party per hearing, and not to exceed per hearing for violations of MLS rules and recs. Now, I've never seen a fine that big in the, in the whole time I've been doing this. And I've been, I've been in the real estate business as an active participant. I got my real estate license in 1976. And so I've been... This is my, my career. This is all I've ever done. I started teaching in the 80s uh, for the community colleges. I now teach at the University of California at Irvine. So, and I'm a CAR instructor and NAR and some other things. So I have a little fun with that. However, <clears throat> the idea behind this is, though I've never seen those larger fines, but they could be there. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be hit with any kind of fine, let alone 15,000. And the disciplinary uh, recommended by the hearing panel is held in abeyance for a designation period of time not to exceed one year. Now, in other words, hi, here's what we think you've done based on the testimony in our professional standards hearing. We believe that you should be fined this amount. However, we can uh, hold it in abeyance at the discretion of the board of directors. Board of directors may say, well, wait a minute. You know, the person was brand new. Uh, the Department of Real Estate is now looking into this. So we may hold off on this until the DRE says, this person does not have a license. Well, if they don't have a license, we don't have to worry about any of this because <laughs> they're not a member of our association anymore. <clears throat> and the discretion, the board of directors are your elected officials and they are where the proverbial buck stops. So they can basically do anything here. Uh, suspension of their membership rights and denial of services of one year, 30 days, a week, whatever. This is, I, I, I've seen this only once. And this was a situation back in the 80s where the guy came in and he verbally abused the, the staff. And it says specifically in the code of ethics, one of your model bylaws, 
you don't do that. <clears throat> so they suspended him from the association. In those days, it was called the Board of Realtors. We still have some boards of realtors here in California. Suspension of all privileges on the MLS. So if you're in violation of MLS rules or regs, the recommendation could be that you be suspended for 30 days or not more than a year, 30 days, a month, whatever. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm out, if my, my MLS is, I'm out, I can't participate in the MLS, I'm pretty much done. You say, oh, Joel, just go one of the other four. Uh-uh. They all communicate with each other. And they say, Joel violated the MLS rules in this one. They're going to say, whoa, we don't want you on our MLS. So, and the same thing with the associations. In your associations, you can, you have board of choice, what they call board of choice, association of choice. You can belong to the Beverly Hills Association of Realtors and not even be close in the area. So we have board of choice now. So they all communicate with each other. You violate one association, they all know about it. So you ain't going to another association easily. And an expulsion from membership for the association if it's more than a year, but less than three years. Now you have to really, you have to have been before the committee several times before you're gonna get into that, okay? <clears throat> it's one of those things where I've seen, uh, I've seen a violation for the MLS uh, over a year, but that's not, not for membership. And then the MLS on terms, again, it could be a year or less, not less than three years in reinstatement. I don't know. If I'm not allowed to be in the multiple listing service for a three-year period of time, <laughs> I'm basically out of business. I don't know about you, but uh, that's just a, that's a door closer. Suspension of all privileges shall include, but are not limited to submitting listings, retaining current listings. So you have listings on there, they're gone. Now, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, there's, there's other ways in which you can market the properties. It's delineated in your RLA, your residential listing agreement. There's all sorts of different ways you can market the property. And some of them do that without putting in a multiple listing. Now, remember, this is a decision between the seller and the agent on an ML on the excuse me on the RLA residential listing agreement. That's between the broker and the seller. They can do anything that they want. The purchase agreement is between the buyer and the seller. It has nothing to do with the agents. And we're seeing more and more agents getting hammered in the courts for an undisclosed interest or making legal determinations for their clients or making decisions on the behalf of their clients without the ability to do so. So there's some certain things that are gonna happen here <clears throat> that for the multiple listing service, you have to be very careful of. All right, so rules that apply to both uh, standard arbitration, you got due process. We're gonna go more in, te in depth than that. And by the way, I'm gonna send a copy of this to Wendy so it's available to you. We're recording this so you can go back and say, Joel, you know, I, I had to take a call. I had to go out to the house. I had to walk the dog, whatever it was. And I missed that portion. Some of you might say, Joel, I'm gonna listen to the whole thing. I, I, I feel like that about the new RPA, Residential Purchase Agreement. I've taken that class five times because every time I take it, there's something new in it. There's something new in that dead gum thing, that 16-page monstrosity <clears throat> that I didn't see before. And we'll talk about some, some of the things that it alludes to that have to do with our uh, Grievance Committee, Pro Standards Committee, and Arbitration Committee. So representation by legal counsel, they're always, they always have that right that's in our state constitution, duty of confidentiality. Anything that happens in any one of these is confidential to a point. Once you're found guilty and that's sent up and, and confirmed, now the confidentiality comes out. And then uh, qualification of the tribunal. As a matter of fact, when you took your agency, excuse me, when you took your ethics class, if you took it through me at the end of that particular class, I demonstrate the reason why you are in that class and that you don't want to violate the code of ethics, the board or association bylaws or the MLS bylaws. And I will do that uh, today in this particular class. 
So we'll be done, let's see, uh, 11, 12, 1, 30, right around in there, okay? And with all the questions I'm getting, <laughs> all right. So qualification of the tribunal. Now we call it a tribunal. Actually what it says is it has to be the, the, the people who are listening to the, the grievance committee on that panel, the professional standards on that panel or the arbitration on that panel, it has to be an odd number other than one. That means three, five, seven. You can't typically, you can't find more than three people that want to sit around, look at the letter, the D1 that was written. And by the way, we're going to be going over forms today. Uh, this is something that I, I feel is very lacking in this course. And you come up with these forms, you go, what the heck are these? I'm sitting on a panel on it. So we'll go over those. Um, so the duty of, uh, let's see, qualifications of the tribunal, um, how you become qualified and some of the different things that you have to know and have. So it's gonna be three, probably. So that's why they call it a tribunal. <clears throat> the qualifications of the tribunal, how that works. We're gonna go over that. And for, just to make sure that we're, you know, we've completed that. Then the enforcement system, and we're going to talk about CRO standards, and then we'll reference the manual. Now, I want, I'm going to do several things that I haven't done in other classes. I have alluded to them, but I believe that now, more than ever, we need to know where the resources are. They're all online and easy to find. And I hate it when I'm called on a panel, and I, I need to review. And so I got a a finite period of time to review before I have to sit on the panel and it may not be enough time. You know, life happens and we're, I don't know, I'm, I'm pretty busy. Let me see here. Um, go to here. This is a day in my life. Okay. Pretty dead gum put together. So um, I, I would like more time. I would like to have the manual and I'd like to study it a couple of minutes each day for a while just to get a feel for it. So I'm going to show you where that manual is, how to get copies of it. It's available to everybody. Arbitration manual also. And the rules that apply to both. And we're going to go over some of those. All right. And then the powers and limitations. So there are different, there are definitely powers and limitations on the, so I am on the grievance committee, pro standards committee, or arbitration committee. I am not the end all to beat all. And the board of directors who are where the proverbial buck stops is not the end all to beat all. We are limited in our powers. And it's basically along these lines. If it's a violation of real estate law, it goes to the DRE. We don't hear those. All right. I had a question here. So um, what I'm going to do is, let's see, it's a... Uh, 1040. Why don't we take a little break here? We'll get up, stretch, run around the room. Uh, let this person communicate um, with me. I gave you my contact information. I will go back and put that on the screen. Take about a 10 minute break here. We'll come back at uh, 50, 1050, and we'll continue along here with disciplinary complaints. All right. So let me go to. No, maybe done about 1230, someplace in there, 130. <clears throat> okay, so I had somebody say, well, wait a minute, Joel, I got some questions. Well, uh, unmute and come on up and talk about those. You know, this is, I, I treat this more as a workshop than as a, I sit here and lecture to you. So if you have questions, feel free to contact me about those questions. I'm, I'm you know, or put them out here because I want to make sure that you people are in the trenches. You're doing this on a consistent basis. If you have a question before you get into that trench, I'd like to have it answered now, or at least tell you where you can get your information. <clears throat> Let me make sure I've got the new share going. Good, good. All right. All right. So expulsion, fine, uh, privileges for MLS, oh, due process. Okay, and then the final qualification for the tribunal and the enforcement system. So um, if you say, Joel, I don't want to ask any questions in front of anybody. I gave you my contact information. Call me, email me, text me. If you say, well, 
You know, I got questions, but I don't even know what they are. I'm with you on that one. Right? Sometimes it's, I got to get through the entire class and I go, wait a minute, I have a question. And I'm going to make this more of a workshop. When we get to the, when we get to about noon, we're going to start doing what I call moot court. And I'm going to show you a, a place where I go. And I know you've all been there because you've been in my classes before for the uh, code of ethics. But I want to analyze some of those situations and get the input so that you know when you're sitting on a tribunal exactly how that's going to work and what kinds of factors come into there. It's like, what? No. Pro Sanders reference manual. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at this right now. <clears throat> I go to a new share screen. We're going to go to the California Association of Realtors. All right, sign in. Let me get this new screen up here. New share. All right, we're going to the California Association of Realtors. Now, you always know you're here because there's somebody sitting in a round chair. I don't even have to look up here to see if I'm at the right place. I know I'm at the right place. Um, if we go to Transaction Center, it gives us another set of drop down boxes. In those drop down boxes, it gives us risk management. And under risk management, here's the RPA, residential purchase agreement. We're going to do a little review on that. Really not on the, well, we are going to do on that the form, a couple of items, and then also some of the attachments. Here's the COVID documents, if you have any questions on any of those. Here's our Q&As. There's over 150 question and answers. You say, I don't want to wait on line on a phone for an attorney at CAR. You can get your, your questions answered here. <clears throat> Just click right here on the Q&A, type in what is the general question or what you're asking about, and there'll be a whole 15, 16 questions answered on that one subject. Then we get down to the closure charts. And then matters, this is risk management. And as a broker, I need to be cognizant of risk management quite a bit. If in fact, I can't find what I'm looking for there, I always go to search. So if we go search pro professional standards, hit the old enter button, here's professional standards committee. Here's professional, let's see. Oh, these are all the notes. What we're looking for is the, uh, the manual, professional uh, reference manual. Okay, so let's make a different search here. Pro standards, standards, standards manual. didn't return anything. I didn't spell it right. Professional. Because I want to show you where this link is so that you'll have this link and you can go back here as to how we got. Because uh, as I told you, it changes every year and I want to have a copy of it on my desktop so that I can look at it periodically just because things come up and they get called on a committee or on a tribunal. Professional standards name. Oh, am I spelling that wrong? Wait a minute. No, professional standard oh, reference. Maybe they want reference in there. Yeah. They're getting to be so picky. Um, I had this, I, you know, I had it all on my you know, when you click here, it has all your, and then I lost it. <laughs> Actually, what they did is they changed it, changed the location. Professional. I'm in trouble with this. Professional standards reference. Maybe I'll take a manual. Maybe that's what the problem is. Okay. Uh, professional Standards Administration Certificate Materials. Okay, here we go. Materials. So Professional Standards Materials. So this is the California Association of Realtors. Sometimes it takes us to the NAR. You, know, you click on stuff and it takes you to the National Association. So Arbitration Mediation Forms 
grievance disciplinary forms. So one of the things I want to do is talk about the forms. Uh, this is where you would find the manual. <clears throat> Let's try a different tack. Let me make sure you're seeing the same thing I'm seeing. Good. Let me go a different tack. Let's go to uh, ner.realtor. Let me give a new share screen here. Oh, it's there, good. Okay, so I just went to the NAR and got standards of practice, a manual, search the code of ethics. Here's your code of ethics as of January, 2022. You say, well, has anything changed? A few little things, nothing major. And we're gonna go over those uh, changes. Uh, what we're looking for is a reference manual. And I, it's here uh, under topics, we'll be able to find it. Uh, reference manual. We just, I just uh, have to look through. And it's one of those things where it's like, this is like a huge maze. If you put up here, search, you can find it. <clears throat> Otherwise you find all these other little interesting things. And then I get wound up in those and forget why, you know, what was the reason I came into the room in the beginning? <laughs> okay. So uh, the reference manual, you should have this. I don't know. It's about 400 pages and it talks about everything. All right, let's go back here. New share, we'll go back to outline. So professional standards manual for enforcement system arbitration there and they made them the same now. So pro standards, that's the grievance committee, pro standards committee and then arbitration, separate committee, separate item. And then rules that apply to both. And the, the rules that apply to both are that they're voluntary committees, number one. Number two, um, you, you can, if, let's suppose Realtor A says Realtor B violated the Code of Ethics, the Border Association bylaws, or the MLS bylaws. At that moment in time, it's going to be heard by Grievance Committee first, and then the Professional Standards Committee. If Realtor A says, hey, Realtor B owes me money, now we're going to go to the arbitration. So anytime they're fighting over money, it's arbitration. Anytime they're fighting over code of ethics, border association bylaws or MLS bylaws, then we're going to go to um, that particular item. <clears throat> that All right. now, because the rules apply to both are these. Uh, there's probably going to be a tribunal. They're going to, they, the tribunal does not ask, does not make the case. I've been on, I've been on tribunals where if you'll just ask that, complain it, if you'll just ask that one question, the respondent will incriminate themselves, but they don't ask it. And I can't say anything. I can just make notes, make sure that I'm taking, getting that done. And then there's powers and limitations on both of them. The powers are is that you, you can call, you can make a recommendation, but you're limited in, you do not mete out justice. And that was one of the problems that I had when I first joined the association, I thought somebody had violated the code of ethics. So I filled out a D1, gave it to the executive officer, executive officer called the grievance committee, grievance committee sent me a nice letter back saying, you need to learn the code of ethics, Joel. This is not a violation of code of ethics. <laughs> it's like, whoa, that was a that was a learning curve. You know, when you're 24 years old, you're full of testosterone and you're thinking everybody's. So that's what got me involved with the board. I've been uh, on the board of directors and educational chair for the 32nd district and the California Association of Realtors, uh, president of the California Real Estate Educators Association. So I got a little involved after that. That was one of those, you need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you're dealing <laughs> kind of a things. So there's powers and limitations. We're going to talk more about that when we get into uh, the different grievance committee, pro standards committee, and arbitration committee. If there is a disciplinary complaint, it's a three-tier process. The first tier is the grievance committee. The grievance committee is a group of volunteers they volunteer their time. Now, what I want to do is I want to go through the forms as the grievance committee works. 
So let's see what it says next, Pub Standards Committee. So we'll we'll back up out of that and we'll go to the forums. Let me get a new share here. I saw our forms here. Share this screen and professional standards materials. So this is professional standards materials out of the California Association of Realtors. Let me make sure I'm on the same page as you are. Good. See, I use, uh, for the last 12 years, teaching the GRI, Graduate Realtor Institute class, we've used GoToMeeting. Whatever screen I'm on, you see it. Zoom says, designate the screen you want the people to see. <clears throat> so I'll be talking about something and people will go, what are you talking about? So if I get like that, make sure you stop me and say, Joel, we're not seeing what you're talking about. So arbitration mediation forms. So let's take a look at the grievance committee forms. So these are the different forms that are available. So the first one is the disciplinary, is the D1. So let's take a look at the D1. You say, Joel, I've already seen this form a dozen times. Good. We're going to take a look at it again. Okay. It talks about the respondents put their name in, um, information. They check off some boxes as to what the violation is. Um, then they go in through penalty of perjury. They declare that they're not being frivolous with this. So this is the form that is used currently uh, to start the Grievance Committee, Pro Standards Committee hearing with the Association of Realtors, might be a board of realtors. We still have some boards of realtors here in California. It says, the above name respondent, the following, you may also choose not to select and instead allow the grievance committee to decide the proper allegations. I don't like that. Personally, it might be better, <laughs> but it makes more work for the grievance committee. And then it talks about the, the different violations. Well, you got to know what those 17 articles are in order to set up that violation. And then exhibit one. So facts and circumstances to support. So they checked off. It's a violation of Article 2. Okay, fine. What's your facts that support that? And I, I am informed that the name of the respondent currently is a member of this association. Okay. The date of the misconduct was this date. And are there circumstances that arise out of this, the respondent involved under criminal proceedings? Now, the reason we want to know this is why. Hey, if you're suing the guy, if you're turning him into the Department of Real Estate, the, the lady in the department, we're out of the deal because we're not a court of law and we don't make decisions on to whether or not your legal situation. So that's why I want to know these things. Have you filed or planned to file a court with the another association? If the answer is yes, it's it's what's called um, double jeopardy. I belong four associations, so I violate the code of ethics. And what they do is they say, "Let's make Joel's life more interesting. We'll file with all four of the associations." Uh, typically, they're going to say no. You file whatever your complaint is, you file with one association, they'll hear it. If you have another complaint, you go with a different association, but one at a time. So that keeps that from getting too onerous. Um, there are people, you know, the old Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times? We're in them. So it's a, it's a we don't want to get into where they are hammering you unjustly because they think you violated the code of ethics. And that's one of the reasons why they fill this out. The grievance committee is the first person, the first group that looks at it. And what they do is they look at this and they say, well, it doesn't look like there's a, you know, based on what you've told us in your exhibit here, it doesn't look like there's a violation of this particular article. Now, let's just talk about this. <clears throat> I've had situations where the, what they put down on here was blatant. And I'd heard it from other people. Oh, how, how the great finance. However, once we say we need this, 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 and this, and you, the complainant, need to show up, they go, nah, we're not going to do that. So at that moment in time, we, as the grievance committee, can become the complainant. If it is so onerous, and the original complainants will give us the evidence that we can say we need this we need this particular realtor sanctioned 
for the violation of the code of ethics. And if the, if the original complainant will not do that, we can take that position. I've only done that twice in my career. And it was both times was very needed. And we got rid of the person. As a matter of fact, within the next year, they both lost their licenses. There wasn't a anything going on or investigation going on during that period of time. But later on, when those things came out, DRE stepped in. <clears throat> so there's situations where and you know, we may be the complainant as the uh, grievance committee. So now, here's the next form. So let's go, oh, wait a minute. Am I, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Oh, good. It always scares me to death that you're not seeing what I'm yammering about here. All right. <clears throat> we come back here to our form. So notice to the respondent. So we got a notice we got to give out to the respondent. This is the person, there's a complainant, Realtor A, and the respondent, the one who has the complaint against them. So when we look at this one, it says notice of the respondent disciplinary action. Um, this is what they're going to receive. And it says, please advise the proceedings regarding this matter are confidential. And they sign that they've received it. Now, we haven't even figured out yet when we're going to have our, our hearing. Then we come down to notice respondent ethics advocate. Now, this is a kind of a newy, and it talks about attaches notice of disciplinary. If you desire assistance in completing the form, contact us. So there will be an advocate. And a lot of times what happens is, so it doesn't waste our time. We will have somebody who is knowledgeable, who will listen to what the complaint is and help them write either response or the complaint. So this is a respondent, so a response to this and, and to what happened here. Just for your edification, in the last year, we have had, my association, my main association is Newport, the elitist Newport Beach boneheads. We've had two instances where the complainant, we named we, the complainant, the respondent, the respondent said to their broker, hey, I'm being hit with this. And the broker said, what? And the broker investigated and the broker said, what you did, idiot, was a violation. And here's your license back and came to the association and said, let's meet and paid a fine without even going through the hearing. Now, I don't know if this is going on in other places, but that just <clears throat> that was one of those situations where these are longtime brokers. The. The one agent was just out of control. As a matter of fact, you know, I don't know if any, either of them lost their license, but I know one moved to Nashville, got out of California altogether, moved to Nashville. So um, I don't know if, the, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to follow up on that. So just, just for my own edification, that was so unfounded where the broker said, hey, these people were underneath my license. They did something totally wrong. I fired them basically, and what would be an appropriate fine? Because I know, you know, this is this was my not doing the right thing and keeping track of them. And both of them had to do, both of them had to do with dual agency. So that's a that's that's a violation of Department of Real Estate law. But um, the the parties all said fine. We'll take the fine, the fact that they've been fired. Um, I know, I don't think the other one, I, I don't know. I have to find out. Anyway, uh, the they basically paid a fine. They, we didn't even come up with anything. The grievance committee didn't even get to hear it. Pro Sanders didn't even get to hear it. And it was decided that based on the, you know, how contrite that the broker was and the fact that they were willing to be sanctioned monetarily, uh, we said, okay, fine. Uh, you, you're well known in the community. This was just an oversight on your part. If the Department of Real Estate gets involved with it, that we have nothing to do with that. <clears throat> we appreciate your honesty in this. So just for your edification, there might be that kind of situation where a, a broker says, no, that's wrong. I messed up. I'm willing to pay the fine and fire these people. Could happen out there. 
So th this particular one that we're talking about is notice to respond at disciplinary hearing if you need an advocate. Go back here, a response. So now we have a response. So, hi, we under, the undersigned respond to the complaint. Here's our exhibit A. So there's a complainant who made the complaint. You violated the code of ethics, the border association bylaws and the MLS bylaws. And then here's the response back. So we, we have an, uh, an exhibit A based on that. So we can get this as a grievance committee. We can say, is this reality? In other words, sometimes the complainants make a complaint just to make the life miserable for somebody else because they're miserable. And this is one of the things that we have to take a look at. Is this just misery that they're trying to put out or is this reality? And then notice of right to challenge. Now, this is the biggie. And I want to spend some time with this one. And here's the reason. We're going to, I, I, I'm on the grievance committee. I'm going to be looking at this. There, there's two rules automatically. So you got 10 people on the grievance committee. I don't know how many you have on your grievance committee, but <laughs> there's, there's a minimum number that you need to have in order to even be able to do this. And sometimes I've had to pull from other associations to, to get help just because we didn't have enough on our committee. Or, and, and that's another thing. I'm always, I'm always recruiting. And I'll bet, I'll bet your association, you know, some of you who've been on this committee for a long time, you're always recruiting. Hey, have you ever thought? And I found out if I say, want to serve on the committee? No. But if I told them, would you like to get some more education on? I got a better response. So we invite them to an educational process and then show them some of the things. And that's how they got interested. So I found out the educational aspect of it gets more members than telling them, you want to join a committee? No, I don't want to. I'm trying to make a living here, Joel. Well, we're trying to keep your living going by making sure we get rid of the bad apples. <laughs> so, but it's the old circular argument. So right to challenge members. So all parties have a right to challenge potential hearing members. I'm on the grievance committee. If the complainant and the respondent, if I'm related by blood or marriage to either one of those, I'm automatically just uh, not able to serve on the panel. If I'm in the same office, of either of these two, I'm not able to say anything to the panel. So please check the appropriate box below. It says I have no objections or I have one or more panel members have included in the detailed basis for a challenge. Now in the old days, they just say you could challenge them. What they did is they pulled this off. Have you ever been on jury duty, you go to jury duty if you've been called on a panel and the, the two attorneys are sitting down there and you're sitting up here and they say, uh, Mr. Carlson, you're excused. Why? They don't have to tell you why. Here, we want you to tell us why. We got to have you tell us why, because we don't have enough members. So this is one of those where I was in the early, well, yeah, early 80s when I was on the uh, grievance committee, there was a guy and he was always doing something wrong. He would challenge every member. He'd just say, I don't want any of them. We didn't have to say why. Now, I want to know why. So. Um, Object to more than one or two, okay? Uh, <laughs> the one, my favorite one for an objection was, I don't want this guy on the, the panel because I had a fist fight with him at the, at the Christmas party. <laughs> Holy cow. Well, I can understand that. Most of the time it's because they've been in the same transaction in another situation and they don't want him on the panel. But they can't say, I got 10 people, two are in the same office, that gives me eight. And then they come back and say all eight. No, you have to give us a reason why. And the form with 15 calendar days, you, you gotta tell us what, what is the problem with those people, okay? Not everybody. All right, so this is, this is to me as a biggie personally, because I've been in situations where I cannot get enough people and they've, they challenged them all. So then there's a member, if we have a challenge for reasons for challenge qualification hearing members. Now, they say this member is challenged and here's the reason. It's just going to be attached. And this is this is voted versus respondent, complainant versus a respondent here. The reason I'm challenging Joel is because he's an idiot. 
No. <laughs> okay. That ain't going to work. It may be true, but it ain't working. Then the uh, notice of hearing. So now when the notice of hearing goes out. Now, this notice of hearing is, is got to be for us. It's not for the complainant and the respondent. We're the volunteers on this situation. My time is very limited, I showed you. So you want me to serve on a panel? Fine, I'm happy to do that, but it's at my time. And it'll probably be at the association. So date, time and location, uh, the appointed panel members, notice there's three of them here and we always have an alternate. And that alternate one is just in case somebody gets sick or I had a situation, one of the large association brokers had a sitch, he had to go, and I was a uh, an alternate. This was when I was in up in Orange, and I got the. I, you had to sit through the whole thing. You just sit there, you know, twiddling your thumbs, can't say anything or do anything. And then I, I was called in, but I was ready because I'd made notes and everything else. I took it serious. Okay, <clears throat> so these are the people. So that you, the complainant, you, the respondent, know who's going to be on the hearing. So now if there's some big deal, you, you can work away from that. So then uh, here's the outline of the procedure. Here's how this is going to work. Now, this is 2022. This is new stuff here. And I want you to know, I, I, I want to personally, I want to look at, I want to look at this personally because these are the things that we're going to have to adhere to. Let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. All right, first of all, let me make sure you're seeing this. All right, well, it's not real good, but I showed you where to get those. And, and I, I downloaded all of them and I sit down periodically with an adult beverage and I go through a couple of them. All right. So, in accordance with the rules and procedures, good. Each party will be given an opportunity. Prior to the hearing, all parties and witnesses will be sworn by the presiding officer. Do you promise to tell the truth? Okay. All parties present and all documents and relative items will be, uh, will be applicable. applicable. <clears throat> in other words, don't bring in, don't filibuster. Don't bring in the, the Encyclopedia Britannica and start reading from the pages. This is not Congress. No testimony will be allowed relating to the character or general reputation. Um, I had a situation where the guy brought in a, he must have brought in 50 boxes of closed files. And he said, this is my reputation. I said, mm, uh, we don't, we're not going to do that. <laughs> Why? Because it's in here. <laughs> At the conclusion, of the parties testifying, the other parties given an opportunity to cross-examine. So anytime there's witnesses, you get cross-examination. Witnesses may only be present during testimony. So the witnesses are sitting outside, theoretically where they can't hear the process. Now, as the alternate, when I was an alternate several, well, back in the 80s, I remember they said, okay, all done, good, we need the witness. So I went and I opened the door and the guy was leaning on the door listening. <laughs> so it's like, no. You need to sit someplace. You're not supposed to be listening to what's going on here. Members of the hearing panel may question the parties and their witnesses at any time during the hearing. Now, we have to be very careful about this, and this is called due process. We don't want to violate anybody's due process. One, two, we don't want to make the case for them. Typically, I'm going to ask questions of clarity. You said blah, 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 blah. Just for my understanding, is this what you meant? Yes, fine. I don't say, ask the one question that'll make the case. Upon completion of the presentation, evidence, testimony, uh, they'll make a closing statement. And the complainant is first one to respond. So we're telling you how this is gonna work. Does this sound like a court case? This is taken right out of the, the procedures in a court case. <clears throat> Upon, uh, so then the hearing was recorded as copies of their will be made available for the parties to purchase. And this is one of those things where typically the alternate is the recording officer. Now, in the old days, we had a little, little recorder and we had cassette tapes. And that was all my job was, was the cassette tapes. So I tried it out and it worked. I said, hello, this is Joel. Does it work? And I, yeah, it worked just fine. 
What I didn't realize is when you plugged it in, it had some kind of problem. And all you heard was once you plugged it in with some kind of problem with the machine. I'd, I'd recorded this whole thing and you couldn't understand any of it. I was so embarrassed. So now I test it all ways if I'm the alternate. And uh, the reality check is this. At our boardroom, we have microphones that hang down and we have a, a recording station over here and it's recorded digital now. So it's, it's, we can test it and it's easy and it just uses one hit and records everything. You're entitled to a copy of it, but you're going to purchase it. What is the cost? You, you decide on that. Hearing a uh, decision is confidential. You can't go out and stand on the sidewalk and say, hey, you ain't going to believe what I just sat through. And at any time during the hearing, the complainant may amend either the complaint or upon motion of the hearing panel. The hearing panel may disallow the request to amend and proceed in the hearing or the complaint. So here's what happens. <laughs> this happened several times with me. I'm on the panel. The respondent says something and, you know, we're all half asleep and, the says, and we all wake up and go, what did you say? This is the person that's being accused of violating code of ethics board by, they admitted, but it was a different violation. And we go, uh, well, at that moment in time, the complainant could say, well, there's one. I want to go after him for that too. Uh -uh. We're listening to this. We've, we've gone through all our forms. We're going to listen to that one item. When that's done, then you can start a new grievance committee, a new pro standards committee. And this is we're now under the pro standards aspect of this. And we're not out of grievance. Grievance just looks at the first couple of them, makes sure, sends out the procedures, and then <clears throat> it goes to the, the professional standards committee and they determine based on a finding of facts what's going on here. All right. So at any time they may. If amended, then they shall file it and be by the presiding offer. So typically, I'm not going to let it be amended. I'm going to just say, start a new grievance pro standards committee situation. And the foregoing is not intended to prevent any other procedures. It's just, you know, to give you an idea as to what's going to happen. Okay, so we got our D8. Then we come down to acknowledgement of the outline of the procedure. Did you get it? Other actions of the hearing panel. Decisions and findings. So here's our decision and findings. Now, we do not make the grievance committee does not make the decision. The professional standards committee does not make the decision. They make a recommendation. And then it goes to the only group of people in your association that can carry out justice, and that is your board of directors. So it's a violation of, and our finding of facts are based on. <clears throat> so at the grievance committee, we said, here's the D1, D2, D3, D4, and here's what's going to happen, D8, in the proceedings. We then look at it. We say, if, if what they said is true, it is a violation. Our job's done. It goes back to the executive officer. Executive officer calls the next committee, which is the professional standards committee. Again, a group of volunteers. And you do the same thing again. You say, hi, here's who's on the committee. Blood or marriage, they're off. In the same office, they're off. You can, you can recuse some of them, but not all of them. Okay, you say, I'm fine with everybody who's on the committee. Good. Now, the grievance committee, their job's done. The professional standards committee actually sits and hears the witnesses and hears the testimony. So that's going to take some time. And the alternate records all this. Make sure that the recording is good and makes that available. Well, actually, the association makes it available if you want to purchase it. What is the cost? I don't know. It's different in every association. Could be nominal. Could be thousand bucks. Who knows? <clears throat> uh, and then what the violations are. Now, this, this, the decision and findings of the disciplinary action of the association. This is to complete it separate for each respondent. We have the complainant who makes the, the claim and the respondent. 
and we, the hearing panel, were duly appointed to hear this. And we've decided you're guilty on these counts. It doesn't mean anything because the, the board of directors have not overheard it. So now what they can do is they can say, are you kidding me? That's bogus. And they can come back with um, availability of rehearing. So now they say, well, I, you know, you guys are a bunch of squirrels. I want it reheard. Oh, great. Now we have to find a new, I'm not going to rehear it. I already made my decision. So I'm off the tribunal. You're going to have to get three more people to rehear it. Actually, they have streamlined this and said, fine, within 20 days after the panel's decision, and it's not binding, it's, and the, the board of directors could say, we don't care what the panel said, we're going to decide a different direction. The board of directors appoint a new panel for the reasons based below, misappropriation, or procedural deficiency, and then in bold red type, it says mis and then procedural, and then unwarranted discipline. So they can say, well, you, you were too much, you're too little, whatever. The request for review must be on the form D-17. Do we have enough forms in our life? I just, I just want to make sure that you're clear on this one. As a CAR instructor that teaches standard forms, I received a copy of everything that's available with zip forms right now. This is it. Two hundred and fifty eight standard forms. Possible real estate transaction. I don't know about you, but I got enough forms. <laughs> so some more forms here. And it clearly indicates the basis of what's the challenge is made. So they can say, hey, I don't think I was given a fair shake here. Here's the reasons. It doesn't, it can go to a new hearing or the board of directors can decide, no, no, we're not going to go to a new hearing. We will hear that portion of the recording that you're objecting to. So it can, it can get quite labor intensive, if you will. Um, and then guidance for disciplinary designated realtors and brokers. So the designated realtor and broker, it's, it's against one of your agents. Typically, it's not going to be against a broker. Uh, it happens, but not as much as their underlings. They're just not educated or not knowledgeable about what they're doing. But the guidance, in other words, so I'm looking, oops, wait a minute. Why is that word? Okay. So again, I'm looking at this guidance for disciplinary, this is the association, this form should be provided to the grievance committee panels and professional standards committee um, in the cases. And it says, according to, and this is uh, 75 of the California regulation of the commissioner. These are regulation, com these are commissioner of real estate regulations. And the commissioner McCauley is our commissioner. They're an appointed position appointed by the governor. And they're overseeing their effect. It is saying, hi, you can submit certain documents. You can give certain information. And to make sure this is guidance for disciplinary. This is so that we know as panel members what kinds of things we can look at. We can be found in violation of the and things that could not be should not be found. Salesperson's actions contrary to the broker um, policy and procedures manual. We're not involved in that. That's between you and your agents. Unless it has monetary, and then it's going to go to the arbitration committee. I've had a couple of those where the, the agreement was, we'll pay you this percentage, of the commission, and they didn't. So we heard that. Anytime there's a fight over money, it's arbitration. And then the actions could not have been prevented by the broker under <clears throat> reasonable supervision. And this was the one where we, as the uh, tribunal, said when those two brokers came, it was two different times, and it was like, did you guys talk to each other or something? It wasn't the same kind of thing, but it was it was dual agency problem, and they both fired the agent, and they, uh, the stipulation was that they had, they were in violation of Article 1, Standards of Practice 1-7. We'll go over that 
in a minute here, it just basically says you didn't, you, you need to prove you, you submitted the offer and came out that they hadn't submitted the offer. Basically, that's a violation of real estate law. But we as a committee just said, fine, you're going to have to, that's going to be taken up with them since they gave, since one gave up their license, moved to uh, Nashville. I think that's a done deal. Uh, the other one, I don't know. You know, it's one of those things where you lose track of things and then you, you don't have enough time to go and figure it out sometime in the future. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Are you seeing this? Okay. I just makes me nervous when it doesn't do the things it's supposed to do. All right. And then 16 deposition or disposition of say, uh, citation consideration. <clears throat> So again, this is in response to the request of the respondent. And this is the person who's been accused. The decision by the MLS to issue a citation has been put out. So this has to do with the MLS rules and regs. We're gonna, we're gonna fine you based on those rather than go through this whole machination. Uh, panel has determined no violation or the term of the violation was, and you'll have to pay for this. So there's all sorts of forms out there. And I wanted to show you these forms just based on the fact we haven't done this in the past. When I was sitting on the committee um, about, about a year ago, I counted the forms. There's over hundred forms that you could use in grievance committee, pro standards committee, arbitration committee. And I thought, well, how do you know about these different forms unless you go over them in class? Well, nothing in my outline says um, you know, I make allude to them, but I don't go over them. Well, I think that that's, <laughs> I think it's important personally. Okay. And then uh, miscellaneous, it can fast track. You can file, uh, before you file the other's complaint, a little Q&A uh, request for an advocate. You say, you know, I, I either I'm new at this or I don't, I don't understand how this works. And we're getting a lot more of that. I don't understand how this works. I need help. Okay, fine. And then submission of photo or dis for, for disciplinary proceedings and hearing by two panelists. Uh, agreement. Uh, that we have three panelists because two out of the three have to agree as to what's going on here. If we don't get two out of the three, you know, it goes back and either reheard or, you know, it's a what do they call that? A hung jury. And then the roles of professional standards volunteers. So this is a new one and it says what your role is. Make sure you're seeing this one. Good. So grievance committee, professional standards committee, board of directors. This is your role. Now, when we're talking about violation of the Code of Ethics, the Border Association bylaws or the MLS bylaws, this is where, it, this is what your role is. It is more detailed than that when you go into the manual. <laughs> okay, this is just like a little taste on the tongue as to what you're supposed to be doing. All right, so I wanted to share those because I felt that it was important that you see some of these different forms, some of them updated 2022, some of them are quite old, 2015. Still working, still doing the same thing, nothing's changed in them. So these are a four disciplinary, the grievance committee, pro standards committee procedures, and then miscellaneous. And you can download them and take a look at them. I picked them up at the California Association of Realtors, Pro standards materials, disciplinary forms. Um, here's, let's see what this does. Yeah, this puts us back there. So here's checklists. Here's another thing. I, um, in the old days, you know, I have a brokerage. I've been running it since 1980. In the old days, my attitude was you do your own file. You you cover it, you take care of everything. This is what you do. You do not have a TC. My attitude has now changed based on the fact that they've made it so complicated. We have a 16 page purchase agreement now with over 70 possible attachments to it. You need a second pair of eyes to look over that. 
So my office policy is now you, you do a real estate transaction with MJC Realty, you must have a TC. <clears throat> I'm going to look at the file. TC is going to look at the file. But what they do is they do a checklist. And the checklist is what makes sure that we get everything done. And I coordinate with the TCs. And I don't care what TC you use. I just need to make sure that these things are covered. You know, having as an a CAR instructor, I know what I want to make sure covered legally as well as ethically and morally. So it talks about mediation checklists, arbitration checklists, uh, procuring cause, showing cause. And this is in the uh, arbitration. Now I want to show you, let me bring that up. This is the procuring cause guideline. I'll do a new share. This is what I received when I first got started on the arbitration committee. They gave us this procuring cause guidelines. And they tell you, okay, if, if you're on the grievance committee, excuse me, arbitration committee, we're going to give you a you know burden of proof we're going to give you a, a chart and on this chart you're going to check off boxes there's 25 items on this favors the closing broker favors the the buyer's broker so check marks over here it favors the intro broker this favors so i want you to make sure that you have a copy of this so i wanted to show it to you when we get into the arbitration part of this class, I'll be referring to this quite heavily. So it's called the procuring cost chart. It's not a checklist. <laughs> and well, then why do you got check marks in here? But it's factors that are, and their factors are not additive. And then I'll show you why number 19 or number 25 can blow the whole thing up. But I wanted to make sure that you understand that that's available since we're looking at our checklist. Here, let's go back to new share <clears throat> so arbitration so we don't do i am a certified mediator but we're not talking about mediation in this particular class we're talking about grievance committee pro standards committee arbitration committee and the arbitration uh talks to you about 2022 procedures then the showing cause and then without an advocate and uh, disciplinary complaints with an advocate so disciplinary complaints that's grievance pro standards arbitration that's money <coughs> uh, let's see what else we have here okay so here's your code of ethics and arbitration manual and then arbitration and then disciplinary guidelines as well as you know here's your procuring cause guidelines there's uh, i'm going to go over the code of ethics what, you know, what's interesting to me, whenever you click on code of ethics, oh, well, it's going to take us to a, a prepared file. It always takes you to the National Association of Real. I can't read this, so I'm not going to use this in class. But I just wanted to show you, this is what they have at CAR. At NAR, it's much more readable, and it's all in a line. And that's what we'll use when I want to go over some of the different articles in our code of ethics as to what is a big problem currently and then some internet uh, articles on real estate on the internet you know, we got a lot of problems with that and it's and the, the validity of signatures <clears throat> if it follows the 2000 global signature act it's good or eula and then there's some other sources train the trainer interboard arbitration now this has been one of those where if we don't have enough people on the arbitration committee, we may ask another association to arbitrate. Um, we just had a situation where there was a, a large association. They had plenty of people on their arbitration committee. We didn't have many. It was between the two boards. In other words, one, one agent was with this association. The other agent was with the other association. So we just said, can you do it? And they said, fine. So it was, it was originated at our association. We transferred it over to that association. And I'm not sure what the ambassador program is, but probably along the lines of what I'm doing right now. <laughs> All right. So I want to just show you professional standards materials. 
and where to get those. So make notes that these materials are available and there's, there's good uh, video on these also, as well as the different Word documents or PDF documents, portable document folder. All right, let's go back here. Go to, oops, I don't want to stop the share. I want to get the share going. Now, just for your, because you know this as well as I do, you all have things to do. And I know you're busy and you have to take this class every two years. And I know that you're probably doing a dozen different things than listening to me. I'm with you, I'm the same way. I gotta take a class a week as a CAR instructor just because they change everything all the time. So uh, the fact that they're recording this is a big benefit. The problem that I have with recordings is, oh yeah, I'll listen, oh yeah, I'll listen. No, I won't. You gotta make, you gotta do something that says you will listen to either the parts you missed or review it, or there's certain little things that you want to know that you can get out of that recording. Otherwise, you know as well as I do, we got plenty to do. We ain't going to listen to nothing. Okay, We went through the class. We're qualified. We'll just wing it. All right, grievance committee, three-tier process. So we talked about the grievance committee, the forms that are involved in that. Pro standards committee, again, the same kind of forms. When, when the, grievance, the pro standards committee, they've approved, they said, we don't want this person on there because they had a fist fight in their Christmas party. Then we send out another one for the panel. It's going to be, should be two different groups, two different sets of people. I know sometimes it's tough with smaller associations. Uh, the, the association that I belong to, uh, Realtors Commercial Alliance, we have 125 members. It's kind of tough to get these committees together. So we do a lot of inner board, ask help from other associations. <clears throat> but the pro standards committee, you're going to have the same things. Hi, here's who's on, here's who's available. Is there anybody complainant or respondent you don't want on the panel, the tribunal? Then here's your tribunal. Then here's what we decided. We're going to send this to the board of directors. Board of directors is going to make a decision on it. And the board of directors are your elected officials. This is one of those things that always stumbles me. People say, oh, well, that decision was made by the grievance committee. No, it wasn't. It was made by the board of directors. The grievance committee passed it to the pro standards. Pro standards and heard it, made a recommendation, and the recommendation goes to your board of realtors, your board of directors, excuse me, your board of directors. And they are where... The proverbial buck stops and they can do anything. They could say, good job committee. They could say, what a lousy job, go back and do it again. Now there's no form that the, the complainant or respondent sends in to say, we're gonna recuse the board of directors. In other words, you got 10 board of directors. I don't like these two guys. I don't want them to hear my, huh. <laughs> they were elected. <laughs> the grievance committee and pro standards committee are volunteers. You can recuse them. You can say, thank you very much for your service, Mr. Carlson. You're excused. Not on board of directors. <laughs> but the board of directors can be whittled down. And we'll talk about that uh, as we go along here. Now, we've talked about the different forms, the grounds for disciplinary violation of code of ethics, violation of MLS rules and regs. And this is the one where it changes all the time. And so we have classes on this from our particular MLS provider that says, and comes from one of the mucky mucks, not the regular trainers, but, and it says, these are the changes. Here's the ramifications. Who decided on these changes? Sometimes I feel like the tail is wagging the dog. The MLS is making decisions on what these rules and regs are. And I've called the... CEO of our particular MLS on the carpet several times and said, I don't believe you have that power. We as realtors cannot influence you, but without us, you are nothing. So I butt heads with a couple of people every once in a while. So the violation of those rules and regs should come from us. And as a uh, a guideline for the MLS. Now we can't, you know, the, the division of church and state, that court case was very specific. 
can't, you know, it used to be wherever the association was in their basement or someplace on the property was the computers that ran the MLS. Now, mm -mm, two separate things, MLS, Association of Realtors. The, the two can't mix. They, they do, but they're not supposed to. <coughs> when we talk about any other disciplinary is defined by the bylaws, we're talking about the board bylaws. And this is association. And I remember when I joined the association, I get a copy of these bylaws, I go, ah, standard boilerplate. No, you need to read them. And there's usually about 10 items in there that if you really knew about them, you go, what? So um, I, <laughs> I don't like to, I don't want to be on the bylaws committee. I've served on that a couple of times. It was like hitting my head against the wall. It felt so good when I quit because it's a lot of work and nobody's happy with it. So the bylaws committee comes up with the bylaws for the association. The bylaws for the MLS are a combination of associations and the MLS company. But association, and this is the one I told you, uh, we had one where the guy came in the 1980s, one of the panels I did serve on, and he, he verbally, I am very bad, had several witnesses to this, uh, the board staff, and it says specifically in the bylaws, no, you got a complaint, you go to the executive officer. You don't berate the people that are in the office. And so he was summarily kicked out of the association. It was a board of realtors back then. So a violation of these. Here's where I learned this. When I joined the grievance committee, they said, hey, are you familiar with the board bylaws? I said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, the article, blah, blah, blah. and I said, what? I mean, they were quoting. And I was thinking, I don't, I don't have a clue what this is. So we started having classes where it would say, let's just take almost like Bible study. Let's just take this one paragraph and see what it says and how to interpret it. So if we're sitting on the grievance committee, is it a violation? Yes. Now it goes to grievance. Now it goes to pro standards. Pro standards then makes a determination on it. Okay, good. So there's a learning process here. And just because you read the bylaws doesn't mean you understand them. <laughs> I'm talking from experience here. So violations of real estate law, felony crimes, and moral turpitude, we don't hear that. That's not in our purview. What we, a violation of the Code of Ethics, the Border Association bylaws, or the MLS bylaws. If it is law, everything stops. It goes to the Department of Real Estate. Now, again, sometimes if it's, if it's a realtor, they'll follow through on it. If it is a, a member of the public, sometimes they go, oh, I don't want to get involved in this. You know, they, they'll come back and haunt me or knock on my door, threaten me or something. At that moment in time, they can turn it over to the association and the grievance committee can say, here's the evidence that we have from the clients. Give it to the Department of Real Estate and they'll investigate. All right, special situation, <clears throat> concurrent discipline and arbitration. Now, this is kind of interesting. Um, it's a violation of the code of ethics, and the guy owes me money. Well, in that particular case, oops, well, let's back that up here. In that particular case, we're going to go to the arbitration committee first. The arbitration committee will hear it, because typically the money, it, it, you know, it's all about the money, right? nobody's told you. Oh, well, it's all about the money. So in that particular case, the money will make a decision for them. So they'll be out of that deal. They'll say, okay, we don't even have to do discipline. They're, it's been decided. Now, if they do decide, okay, you owe me money, and it does decide, yes, you owe money, and you still want to go to discipline, that'll be in the second. So first arbitration, second discipline. The grievance committee, pro standards committee. If you do them both at the same time, and they won't. So standing committee member, minimum five, that's what our bylaws say from CAR. That's what it says from NAR to CAR. CAR said, okay, fine. And then they have different uh, delineations, if you will, for size of associations. Duties determine if the complaint is a violation, bylaws, board bylaws, MLS bylaws, and the panel selection. So we went through the forms, got to be an odd number, can't be related by blood or marriage. We covered all of this. Good.
So now the grievance committee dismiss. What? They dismissed it, refer it back to complainant or forward it to the, the professional standards committee. So I've had situations where we sit there and we look at the, the grievance committee, looks at it and go, there's no violation here. There's, it, it's, it's on the edge, but it's not a violation of the code of ethics. And we have to send it back to them. Now, on two occasions, personally, I've recused myself from the grievance committee. I've gone to that person and I've said, look, what you've written down in your exhibit one, that is a violation of the code of ethics. But what numbers you wrote down, it has nothing to do with that. Let me help you write up the complaint properly, the D1. So I've done that. Right. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you are encouraged to do that by our uh, board association bylaws that we need to get rid of the bad apples that are out there, or at least educate them. Sometimes they say, no, I know everything. And then you go to a panel and they go through the hearing and they get the, the decision. They go, hmm, had a learning experience there. Uh, they can dismiss, they can refer it back to the complainant. Uh, you know, sometimes the complainant just was not writing it properly or they can forward to pro standards. So those are the things the grievance committee does. And we talked about the forms and we talked about how many people and we talked about who can serve and who can't serve related by blood or marriage or the same office. And the biggest thing is confidentiality. And I'll tell you, some of these things I hear, I want, I want to stand on the street corner and say, are you kidding me? But you can't do that. It's confidential. All right. So members of the public can also make a complaint and they basically need help. So we have a procedure for that where we got 10 people on the grievance committee, two of them or one of them will back off the grievance committee and help that person write it up. Cannot serve on a panel or anything to do with that particular hearing. <clears throat> so the, there could be parallel proceedings. Again, um, if it's a legal proceeding where it's going to the Department of Real Estate, it's, we're going to go on hold until the Department of Real Estate decides, yes, there is no violation, or yes, there is a violation. We're taking their suspending or revoking their license. So, and then arbitration, arbitration is always going to go first. Civil litigation, <laughs> that trumps everything. So they're going to go first. And then there's going to be the director's review. Now, I told you, the, the buck stops with your board of directors. They are your elected officials. Yeah, it's almost time for a break. <laughs> You're right. Um, so we make a recommendation. The grievance committee says, okay, goes to the, back to the executive officer. Executive officer calls the professional standards committee. Professional standards committee hears it, gives a recommendation to the board of directors, and they then make the decision. Good job committee, we'll go with your recommendations. Bad job committee, go back and do it again. Hi, you did okay, but we wanna change a few things. They can do anything. They are your elected officials and they have to take this class every two years, just like grievance, pro standards and arbitration. <coughs> they are your elected officials. You say, well, I didn't vote. Well then be quiet and take your beating. You had an opportunity to vote, you didn't take it. Okay. I've been in 40 different countries in the world, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the, one of the greatest countries, this is the greatest country in the world, because one of the reasons is we have the right to vote. Now, if you don't take that right, that's up to you, but you have nothing to say in the process. I've been in countries where you vote at the end of an AK-47, so our process is a little bit superior to that, in my opinion. So you didn't take the time to find out from your who your directors were, you they got voted in, you don't like the decisions they're making, that's your fault. You didn't get involved in the process. So make sure you, I call them up. I put their feet on the fire. I say, why do you think you can represent me? Let them answer. Make sure. Grievance committee, the timing, 120 days for the complaint. So something happened, it's 181 days, too late. You have to file with the grievance committee within that period of time, six months. And the committee could be the complainant. I've talked about this. And we're gonna do a case study when we come back from our next break. It's probably our last break, let me think. Well, we'll have a couple more.
maybe five minute breaks instead of 10 minutes. So I want you to get up, stretch. It's uh, 11.56 when Mickey's big hand is on the, um, let me see, 16. No, six, turn, per, per, uh, let's make it 10 minutes, uh, 12, 10. What is that, 15 minutes, 14 minutes. Make it 12, 10. At 10 minutes after 12, we'll go ahead and get started here. Again, if you do have questions, please call me, text me. Write them in the text. Well, wait a minute. Maybe you already have been doing that. I apologize. Let me check here. Uh, 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 let's see if I've got any. No, nothing in the chat. So if you want to put something in the chat, you can go ahead and do that. And I'll answer those questions. Just say, Joel, I don't have any questions. I don't want any questions. I just want to get this done. I'm with you. I hear you. Okay. <laughs> I have to see. I, <laughs> I got to sit through this too <laughs> every year every two years. All right, so 10 minute break, ready, go. Time keeps stretching. We're, just, we're out of here at 1.30, maybe a little sooner. Nobody's asking any questions. You must be getting all of this really good or, <clears throat> I know I've been out there. I got, I'm telling you, I got a thousand things to do. I'm listening to you, Joel, but I've done this three or four times and it's the same information each time, I know. Or I'm brand new at this, this is all great but I'm still trying to make a living. I'm good, I'm good. We go through this, we'll be out of here and you'll have that hurdle done. All right, so which violation is it? I don't know, Joel, tell us. Okay, good. It is violation of Article 12. You have to tell them that you're a realtor and it has to be all caps with the R. That's what it says in your bylaws. Ethics. All right. So <clears throat> now, the Press Professional Standards Committee, minimum nine. You say, Joe, we don't have that many. I know. I got several associations. We don't have that many. They're just talking about this. If you've got enough that they can handle what's going on there, fine. I'm always having to talk to other guys and gals and get them involved. I'm constantly trying to beef it up. And I, I do it through what I told you, education. Duties, they hear the complaint, make a determination. And then they make recommendations. We don't make that. They don't say, you're guilty and we're going to punish you. That's the board of directors that get that. They're your elected officials. <laughs> uh, the timing, 15 days after distribution of the complaint. Remember all those forms? Then we're going to... Um, and if there's no any reply, so they can they can object to who's on the committee, they can object to the date and time. You know, there's all sorts of things they can object to, and there's also a list for possible members to be challenged, and they have to do that within the 10 day period of time. So we send them the list. They don't challenge anybody, or they say everybody's fine. We're good to go. Due process. Now, there's other non-legal representation that can be there. Typically they say, I want my attorney there, fine. The attorney, you have to make sure that you, they, they understand. The attorney is not there to say, objection, your honor, and to speak on the behalf of the client, on the behalf of the complainant or respondent. If I, as a tribunal member, ask a question of the client, I want the answer from that client, excuse me, the, the uh, respondent or the complainant. I don't want to hear from the attorney. The attorney is there <coughs> to give them little hints of things, to, questions to ask. And I'll tell you, attorneys, in the old days, I'd say, keep the attorneys out of this deal. Now, attorneys come from an adversarial situation. And, and what you've got going on here is an adversarial situation. They know the questions to ask the other party to incriminate themselves and to bring out the truth in the situation. So. In the old days, I didn't want any attorneys. Now it's like, if you come with an attorney and the other one doesn't, I say, uh, time out, come here. You don't have an attorney. That's right. I'm going pro per. Fine. You're coming to a gunfight with a knife. You're going to lose. I'm just telling you, I've, I've sat on enough panels and seen this happen. They think they know what they're doing. And the attorney just asks them that one incriminating question. They answer it and it's like, that's the end of that deal. 
there's forms, maximum one company each, odd number, not related by blood or marriage. Then you got 15 days in which to challenge. And then we always have to have an alternate in case something happens. Um, I, I've been on a committee where the old, one person went down, the alternate stepped in, another person went down. You, we got to postpone until we can get three because we have to have an odd number. <clears throat> and they can amend, withdraw, or by the Now, this happens every once in a while where they want to amend it. The, the, the respondent will say, blah, 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 and everybody will go, What did you just say? You just incriminated yourself on a different situation. Well, we can amend it, but typically, um, that's going to be before everything starts. Eh, they find out something before we get started. If we're already in the middle of testimony and everything, and you want to amend it, mm -mm. you're going to have to have a whole, you're going to have the grievance committee, pro standards committee all over again. <coughs> can it be withdrawn by the complainant? Sure. The complainant can say, you know what, I've decided I don't want to fight this, or I don't have time, or I guess maybe it wasn't as important as I thought it was. At that moment in time, the professional standards committee may recommend that the grievance committee be the complainant, get all the evidence from the complainant, and they, because the violation is so onerous, that they may want to do that. All right, then we come in with changes to complaint before the hearing, fine, after the hearing, no, <laughs> going to start it all over again. Rules of the hearing, there's due process. But the rules are no fist fights, no jumping up and yelling, objection, your honor. You know, there's a certain things that we're not a court of law. And I just want to talk to the people that are involved, Mr. or Miss Attorney. And then continuance fees. Now, the first one, there's no cost. That's what it says in your bylaws. So somebody says, I, I you know, I, I came to this hearing and I'm not prepared based on the fact that they brought in evidence. We don't have any, we got to prepare for this evidence they brought in. That's why I always say, hi guys, how y'all doing? We got the complainant responded. What are you bringing complainant to defend yourself or to, to, make, the, to make the complaint? What are you doing to, to defend yourself? Trade, just like they do in court. You have evidence, I want to see it ahead of time. So I know what kind of a defense to mount. So trade up. If you bring in something new, you know, you pull the old Perry Mason. He always used to pull that thing out of the air at the very end. And that was the guilt. Uh, -uh. We want to know everything ahead of time so that we can, def we, we want due process. We don't want him to scream. We didn't have due process. So make sure anything that's brought in by one party has been shared by the other party and that they have time to prepare. Otherwise there's going to be a continuance. First one's free. Second one, there's nothing under our, our manual that says what we have to charge. <clears throat> so you can, whatever your association wants to charge. Um, it's different in the th four associations I belong to, but it's basically $250 for the first one, $1,000 for the second one. So the first one is free. The second one costs you $250. Uh, the third one is $1,000. $1,000? Yep. Because every time you do that, you have to rearrange everybody's schedules. And we're all busy. We don't want you to do, I need a continuance. Why? I got to get my shoes shined. No. <clears throat> no shows. Ah, duty of competence. What happens if the complainant, I'm making the complaint against the respondent <clears throat> and I don't show? Well, in the old days, it was now. We get on our cell phones, we call their home, we call the office, we call the bar, find out where they are and say, hey, you're supposed to be here. In where I do business, 99% of the time, they're stuck on the freeway, <laughs> okay? Now, in COVID, that wasn't true, but now it's true again. Same thing with the complaint, the, the respondent. We call up, try to find them. We'll wait a 15, 20-minute period of time or whatever everybody agrees to. If they don't show up, here's what happens. If, if the complainant does not show up, it's dismissed. You're the one making the complaint. You don't show up, it's dismissed. I know there's a million different excuses. If the complainant doesn't show up, it's dismissed. If the respondent 
does not show up. The one they say, you, you committed these, we can go ahead with the hearing. <laughs> we can say, okay, uh, why do you think that Realtor A violated the Code of Ethics, the Association of Board Bylaws, the MLS Bylaws? Realtor A said, well, uh, Realtor B, what's your response? Crickets. Okay, fine. Uh, you don't show up, <laughs> we can go ahead. It's not postponed automatically. And then once the decision is made by the panel, <clears throat> approved by the board of directors, unless they're concerned about procedural deficiencies. And this is another thing. Um, in, in now today's day and age, your decisions, board of directors, need to be reviewed by an attorney for procedural defects or due process. <sighs> ah, that's the biggest problem we've got out here right now is due process and procedural determinations. So with that in mind, they're, you know, they're, <laughs> the recommended sanctions may be too much. Anyway, you're going to have your attorney, your, your association attorney, and it can be sent back to be reheard or a new panel selected. We've talked about that. <clears throat> okay, so petition for rehearing. So what happens is they want to be reheard because they think we were discriminating against them or whatever. Only if new evidence that could not have been discovered previously. So you want to have it reheard? Why? Well, I think Joel is a bum. That's nice. No. Oh, we found out something in the testimony by the complainant. We found out something that we need to have uh, submitted. We want it reheard with just that piece of evidence. And that I, I've done that one time, and it turned the case. And as a matter of fact, the, the complainant said, "Okay, I surrender." <laughs> I mean the uh, Respondent said, okay, I surrender because it was just too damning. And it's one of those where if you can get the buyer or the seller that they were dealing with to testify <laughs> under oath, you got nothing. Most of the time, you can't get the buyer and seller to come in. <clears throat> but if they do, they're in good shape. If the panel does not grant a rehearing within two weeks, then they, it's denied. And either party may make an appeal. Uh, the rehearing, if the, they want to reheard for 250 bucks, it's, it's in our bylaws on that. And by the way, I'm going to send a copy of this so you can review this, you know, it's, if you find the need um, after the class. I'm going to send this to Smiling Wendy and let her make that available to you. And you also you have the recording. Finding a fax and disciplinary action is sent to all parties. Then... What happens if they refuse to honor the director's? So what happens is grievance committee says, yep, there's a violation. Goes to pro standards. Pro standards say, whoa, you're a, you're a bum. We're going to fine you 3,000 bucks. And the, the, the respondent says, I ain't paying the $3,000. <clears> Your board of directors get a declare a uh, judgment against you. They can get a judgment again. You say, what? Remember when you joined the association? You signed all that paperwork? Did you read it? You didn't read it. It's what it says. Your board of directors, if a decision is made, can get a judgment against you in the name of the complainant. Actually, it's in the name of the association. It'd be in the name of the complainant if it's an arbitration. All right, so case study continued. <clears throat> Realtor A recently, uh, what violation? Okay, we know it's violation of Article 12. However, two months later, they're charged with the identical violation. <clears throat> now, here's how this happens. Everything is confidential. Nobody knows what happened. I'm in the, I'm in the, the professional standards committee. I don't know what happened the last time because it's confidential, you're not allowed to talk about it. However, there's a letter that goes into the file and says on this date at this time, here's what the, the committee decided, or here's what the committee recommended. Remember, we can't make decisions. And if in fact, Realtor A shows up again within this period of time, here's our recommended punishment, excuse me, our recommend, yeah, recommended punishment. So now what happens? Realtor A ain't getting it. They're back before the committee. The committee doesn't know anything about the first violation of Article 12. Now they look in the what I call the jacket. You know, those criminals have that. And it says, hey, they were here two months ago. Here's what we decided. And if they were back again within a six-month period of time, here's what our recommendations are. 
Well, the committee, the new professional standards committee says, hold same. We don't even have to have the hearing. A month later, they do it again. Oh, wait a minute. They did it once, twice, and now they're back for a third time? We got some learning to do here. <laughs> okay. Now we get down to the arbitration committee. Now, I've got some things I'm going to cover before we get out of here today. <clears throat> that is, I'm going, to, I'm going to go through some things on your RPA, residential purchase agreement, that I think you as professionals, one, two, as members of these committees, and three, as directors, need to have cognizance of. And then I'm going to give you the peace studies that stones. For those of you who haven't been in my class in Tulare before, as to exactly why, and we're going to do some moot court. Why you're here today and moot court. Moot court is we pretend we're in a hearing and what would we have decided? <clears throat> All right. So arbitration committee, standing committee, five people, establish the rules of the hearing. Okay, we send them out. And, and was it D? We were on the D. For arbitration, it's A, A1, A2, A3, and it basically says the same thing. We're going to pick a committee. Excuse me. We are we have a committee. Anybody on that committee, you don't want to hear about, or you don't want on the panel. Yes, for these reasons. Okay. Who's ever left over? We're going to pick an odd number other than one. So that's three. Probably. Could be five, seven, but it's probably going to be three. <clears throat> and then how this is all going to work. We're going to send you out the rules and regs on that. Panel selection, odd number, not related by blood or marriage. And they select a chairperson. Now, I don't know why I'm always the chairperson, but pff, I am. And that chairperson is the mouthpiece for the other two. So we're on the tribunal, and the chairperson is the one. I, you have a question? What is it? Okay, and then I'll ask a question. <clears throat> it, keeps the, it keeps the lines of communication clear. Can they have a representative? Now, on the, on the professional standards, they can have an attorney or a representative. The representative is typically the broker, a non-legal represent, representative. It'll be their broker. The broker says, "Why? Are, what are you talking about? I want to hear this testimony. And that's those were the two we had that said, whoop. They didn't even get the testimony. They just saw what the, they then did their own investigation. They saw what the complaint was. They did their own investigation because broker got to get a copy of their ultimate libel form. And they did their own investigation. Went, Oops, <laughs> this agent is no longer in our employ based on what I have found out in my own investigation. So they can have, again, that, that representative, non-legal representative, doesn't participate in it. We're not talking to them. We're talking, we're not, we're talking to the complainant, the respondent. The attorney, they can tell them what questions they ask, but they're not a part of this. They only, they, we are only talking to the respondent and the complainant. Tape recordings, talked about this, same thing. I, I, I haven't seen a court reporter in a long time, but if they ask for a court reporter, they can definitely have a court reporter there. Same thing with the professional standards. Now, well, I won't go into court reporters. It's just all electronic now. I mean, I can I can talk to my I can talk to this, and it types it faster and more complete than a court reporter can. So I don't know if they even have a job anymore. Probably do. Right of copies. Everybody has a right of copy. There, there's going to be an alternate, and the alternate's typically going to take care of the recording process or be in charge of it or something else. We have a at one of the associations, we have a technician. His whole job is to record these different things because the association has over 10,000 members in it. <laughs> so we've got a full-time job. Uh, due process, and we're going to go over this. So through the technical processes of law, we have to make sure that we fundamentally follow that. And these are the due process. Adequate notice of complaint. You can't tell them, hi, we're going to, this thing is going to be tomorrow morning. Wait a minute. I don't have enough time to prepare. Two, they got to have time to prepare a defense. Now, it has to be uh, reasonable. And I don't know what reasonable is, but I would say a couple of weeks to a month. Represented by legal counsel, absolutely. Challenge for potential tribunal members. They get to challenge us. Can't challenge everybody, though. Got to have a reason. Necessary continuance for good cause. Hi, 
the reason they want to continue is not a good cause. They don't have, they're just trying to, it's just like attorneys when they have a court case. So what they do is they keep dragging it out, dragging it. Finally, everybody gets tired and says, forget it. And that's a technique. Okay. The courts don't, the courts frown on that and they, they push them to what's called fast track. So we have the same situation here. Testify on their own behalf. They always have the right to testify on their own behalf. Call and cross-examine any witnesses against them and notification of what the, what the decision rendered. So we can't just say, oh, we're not telling you why you're kicked out of the association. No, here's the reason. <clears throat> so that's due process. And that's if there's any problem with this whole thing, it always revolves around here. They sit down with an attorney and the attorney says, I don't think you got due process. Ugh. We got to start this horse and thing all over again. All right. Arbitration committee, evidence, and witnesses. Again, you got evidence, make copies of it, give it to the other party so that they can mount a defense. Witnesses, they get to cross-examine. MLS members only. Now, this is a kind of a newie. Well, that's not newie. It's uh, in my lifetime as a real estate professional because we had the association and the MLS were the same. Now it's two different things. So if you're an MLS member only, you're not a realtor. You don't subscribe to the code of ethics. If you're not a realtor member, now um, I belong to different associations. Some of them have their own MLS or have an MLS that's associated with them. I'm not a member of that MLS, but I still am a realtor. Once a realtor, always a realtor, no matter what you're doing. That's what article one says. You need clarity on that. So an MLS member only, they're fighting over commission. Now, here's where I'm going to address that decision that was put together by the Department of Justice last year. Yeah, it was last year. Agreed to by everybody in the government of the United States of America and agreed to by the National Association of Realtors in October, the DOJ reneged on it. Unheard of, unprecedented. Everybody's still scratching their head saying, how can they do that? <laughs> They're, it needs, they cannot individually do that. They have to have concurrence from the government. So, so in this instance, <clears throat> here are the four things that the Department of Justice and the National Association of Realtors agreed on. Number one, compensation must be disclosed. Now, remember, the National Association of Realtors for the United States, apparently, on some MLSs, if you were a member of that association, they would tell you what the commission was. If you're just an MLS mem only member, they wouldn't tell you. Well, I, we've never had that trouble here in California. So that was a new one to me. So you have to disclose what the commission is. NAR said, fine, we do that anyway. And that's what should be done. Number two, uh, there's, you can't offer anything free. In other words, when I talked to you this morning, I said, I use buyer representation agreements. The implication there is that you, buyer, being represented by me and you don't pay me anything. Well, the reality is, where does the seller get the money to pay me? From the buyer. So the buyer is paying. And if I say, oh, well, the competitive market analysis is free. If you do list the property with me, it was not free. So based on that, and based on the fact that I've talked to some of the attorneys at the California Association of Realtors, and their opinion is no cost at this time. It is not free, and there ain't nothing free anyway. There's just no cost at this time. Well, when will there be cost if I list the property? When will there be a cost if, in fact, you buy, you're using a buyer representation agreement, and you buy with another agent not using my services, then it's going to cost you. <clears throat> so as long as we make those disclosures, nothing is free. That was the second one. The third one was no commission filtering. So in other words, when it went out to the internet, it, in the MLS, it says, hey, buyer's agent, seller's agent, this is how much commission. When it goes out to the internet, they could scrape what pulled the commission off of it. So if you are licensed in East Ugandi, excuse me, you're licensed in California, but you live in East Ugandi, and you have somebody who wants to buy the property here in California, it didn't tell you what the commission was. They took it off the internet. 
Well, now we have to leave it on there. No filtering. So when it goes out to East Uganda, they say, here's how much commission you're going to get. If you have a real estate license, valid real estate license, state of California, here's what you earn. Nobody had a problem with that. The last one was lockboxes. They said, um, you must give a licensed agent access to the lockbox. Well, I use Supra. You got to make your, if you want access to my lockbox, you got to make your deal with Supra. If you make your deal with Supra and Supra's happy, I'm happy. So I never had this problem. Personally, in the state of California, I don't think there's a, other states though are still using combo boxes. So they wouldn't give the combination out to somebody who was not a realtor. So if it is a combo box, they have a valid real estate license in the state where they're doing business, you must give them the combo. DOJ said, this is what we want. NAR said, fine, signed it. Everybody was good with it. And then DOJ changed their mind in October of last year. So now, you know, you can go to NAR.com. You can put in DOJ decision and you can see what it was originally from the head attorney at NAR, <clears throat> what her, or her delineation was, what Otto's, uh, the president of the National Association of Realtors, what his delineation was, and then how it changed. And we're all going, we don't know. We're going to go with the four because that's what we agreed to until something else comes up. So those are the four things about MLS only. And then right to waive, both must agree. So if they both waive arbitration, you know, they one started it and the other one says, oh, okay, and they waive it. Sometimes they come up with an agreement. I don't want to sit through arbitration. What are you after? I'm after $10,000 of the commission. Good, here's 10,000. <clears throat> no finding of facts is submitted. When the tribunal sits here on the professional standards, we must have facts. And based on those facts, we make our determination. On the arbitration committee, well, I feel like they should get some money. Now, I showed you the, um, fine, uh, the procuring cost chart, and we'll go over that a little more in detail. It is confidential. Same thing with... Uh, the um, pro standards, and it's binding. And I told you, if you, in fact, if the committee says we recommend this and the board of directors say we agree, if the complaint, the respondent says, I'm not going to pay, the board of directors can put a judgment in the name of the complainant against the respondent. That's what it says in your MLS. Now, board of directors, you're elected by the membership. You have to follow the rules and regs, and you have to be specifically cognizant of those. And there's procedures. You have to meet every once in a while. You have to go over the board bylaws, make sure they're updated. Um, you, you have a whole list of things that you have to get done for NAR and CAR, um, having been a director now for the last 10 years, my associations. Um, it's a lot of work. And there's meetings, and the meetings are typically monthly. They can be more often or less often, but it's usually monthly to do business of the association. It's not an automatic review. If they say, I want this, I don't like the decision that was made by these board of directors, I want it reviewed, or there's new evidence, I want it reviewed. It's not automatic. Pro standards, as well as arbitration. They have limited scope and a power. So if, I, if you want me as a director to review it, First of all, we have to recuse ourselves from the directors and we have to sit and look at what your, what's your evidence. So here's the evidence. Then we, and we've got to be an odd number other than one. So three directors are pulled out of the full, full directorship for making decisions on this particular matter to review it. <clears throat> the directors review as a tribunal. So there's three of us. And the documentation considered is not everything. We've already had a committee look this over. They've made the recommendation based on the hearing. You have a specific item you want us to review as directors. That's what we'll review. We're not going to review the whole thing. And the director's action is, this is our decision. And if you don't like it, we're going to put a judgment against you. Now, again, 
um, the finality of the broker's review, you want to make sure you have this gone over by legal, your attorney, to make sure that due process was done and nobody did something outside of the purview of what they were supposed to be doing. And in the board, in your in your MLA, excuse me, in your board association bylaws, it tells you what duties that your directors have and what they can and cannot do. All right. So enforcement of the award, it is, you know, I told you the board of directors could put a judgment. You should have a judicial review of this. Your attorney should take a look at it and a confirmation of it to make sure it's due process, wasn't outlanded, and vacation. It's not what you're thinking. They could say, wait a minute. We heard, we heard, we heard your recommendation. Um, arbitration committee. We're not going to go with it. We're going to vacate the whole thing. Just like it never happened. So now questions and answers. So before we get into questions and answers, here's what I want to do. <clears throat> I want to come back here. So we'll get a new screen share going. So we're going to come back here to these different forms and things. <clears throat> oh, I do want questions and answers always want questions and answers because a lot of times the questions you ask is like oh i forgot to cover that so let me see if there's any questions and answers oh nothing in the chat all right so we were going to talk about now see this is arbitration so if we go to the arbitration checklist okay we can go to the arbitration checklist okay computers thinking Ooh, oh a question oh my gosh i'm all excited that means you're doing your job. That's right. <laughs> I thank you very much. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so administrative re review process. So the complaint, the respondent, it talks about the manual, okay? <clears throat> and it talks about the different parties and the complaint and the guidelines. So providing these different items. So this is just like a checklist. I went over and I talked to you about let me see where that is here. I talked to you. Let me get the screen share going. The procuring cost. So this is a procuring cost checklist. When I joined this associate, the uh, arbitration committee for the first time, I got a copy of this. And then I, I sat on a few meetings and the decisions were made based on these 25 items. There's 25 items here that they look at. 25 items. And they put a check mark in the, procur the procuring broker, uh, the, excuse me, the intro broker. And then they put a check mark in the procuring broker. Okay, so we're going to run a scenario. Um, Realtor A is out showing their property to a buyer. Realtor A. The buyer says, hey, 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 see that open house? Can we stop at that open house? The, the, the realtor says, sure. They stop at the open house. It's Realtor B's open house. They look around, they leave. About a month later, Realtor A finds out that their buyer went directly to Realtor B and bought the house. Realtor A says, hey, I'm the procuring cause. You owe me money. Calls up the other agent, says, on this date at this time, I brought those buyers over. I showed them the property. You know it. You owe me money. Realtor B says, I'm not going to pay you a dime. Realtor A says, I'll see you in our uh, tracing. Fills out an A1, go, goes through that process. And as we're sitting there and they're giving testimony back and forth, this is what we, the tribunal, have in front of us. So buyers introduce the property, blah, 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 checkbox, checkbox. You could get 24 of the 25 <clears throat> checked and you could still lose. Look at number 25. Now you say, well, I don't have a copy. Well, I'll show you the 25. Number 25, intro broker failed to give an agency disclosure statement. By law, you must give an agency disclosure statement. Now, let's make sure we're clear on this one. <clears throat> I want to bring up the uh, purchase agreement. I want to take a look at that because that's getting to be a, a big concern as we do business based on the fact it's got three elements in it that I've never seen in the purchase agreement before. And I've been doing this business since 1976. Good, bad, or indifferent, they're in here. 
So let me go to a new share. This is the agency disclosure form. This form was given to us in 1988. It was given to us by the state legislature. This is one of two forms that was given to us by our state legislature in Sacramento, the agency disclosure and the TDS, transfer disclosure form. This basically says, here are your duties under the law. And if you look at the law, it's right here. It's on the back of the, every one of these agency disclosures. It's, 20, it's 2079, the civil code. <clears throat> and it basically says this, if you're the listing agent, if you're a buyer's agent, if you're a seller's agent, you have a fiduciary duty. Okay, so I got a fiduciary, I know what that is, my highest binding trust. But the biggie is this one. You have a diligent exercise of reasonable skill and care in the performance of your duties. That means you need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you're dealing. If you're dealing on residential properties, one to four in this city, then you need to know all the forms that are involved with that one. Two, you need to know what the city's rules and regs are, what the county's rules and regs are regarding housing, and what the state of California's rules and regs are. The same fun and games anymore. This is serious stuff. And the same thing with the buyer, buyer's agent. And if you're a dual agent, it's doubly now, the three-step process is disclose, elect, and confirm. If you do not follow those three steps properly, on the back of this form, it says right here, you're not entitled to a commission. Well, I don't know about you, but that's how I get paid. So I want to make sure I follow the three steps. First step is you got to give them this agency disclosure form. You have to give it to them at a specific time. It says on the back of the form, the, the last minute in time is on the back of the form. It says before they sign the purchase agreement or before they sign the listing agreement. That's the last minute in time. But it actually tells you right on the form when you're to give it right on the first page of the form. The buyer signs it, the seller signs it. It says the law requires each agent. That's you with whom you have more than a casual relationship, whatever that is, to present you with this disclosure form. It's right there. So now what you need to do is if you're not the broker, you need to find out from your broker, what is a casual relationship? Here's the definition of a casual relationship at my company. If you start showing them property, you form more than a casual relationship. You get the buyer to sign this. If you go on a listing presentation, you form more than a casual relationship, you get the seller to sign this. When they sign it, does it obligate them to anything? No, it says they acknowledge a receipt. That's all that is. It's just a receipt of what your duties are. Not that you're going to do them. You do that on the first page of the purchase agreement. So the first step is you give them this agency disclosure form. That's law. If you don't do that, what are you doing going after commission? So when we talk about new share, uh, 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 you failed to give this. First of all, you're in violation of real estate law because you didn't. You're, you're now in arbitration. It's months later. And you didn't do what you're supposed to do. You get nothing because you're in violation of the real estate law. You ain't going to have a license in order to get that commission. Number 19 talks about the intro broker has a buyer representation agreement with that buyer. Oops. So now if you have a buyer representation agreement, here's what it becomes incumbent for you to do as the open house broker, as the closing broker over here on this side. Okay, I'm sitting on open house. A buyer comes walking and says, oh, I love this home. I want to buy this home. I want you to write up the offer. I say, terrific. First thing I want to know is, have you ever signed any agency disclosure forms? We just talked about that. New share, agency disclosure. Have you ever signed any of these? Oh, yeah, I've signed dozens of those. <sighs> They're working with everybody in town. <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> have you ever signed a buyer representation agreement? And I show them what that looks like. We go here and we put in search uh, buyer, buyer, buyer rep. Buyer representation, non-exclusive. Let's go with an exclusive buyer representation agreement. Have you ever signed? I always show it to them. Have you ever signed one of these? Now, this is an 11-page form. 
Let's go back here. This is a buyer representation agreement. It's exclusive. It says if you have signed one of these, buyer, then you probably got to work with that other agent. Otherwise, you'll owe them a commission and me a commission. I'll get a commission from the seller, but the other agent won't. They'll want their commission. You're going to pay them a commission. If they say, oh, yeah, I have one of these, then my response is, I can't talk to you anymore. You need to go talk to that agent. Now, this is what your code of ethics say. You need to ask, have you ever signed one of these? No, here it is, agency disclosure. Number two, have you ever signed a buyer representation agreement? Yes, I have. Now, you know, as well as I do, they don't know what they signed. But if, there, if there's an inkling that they might have, your code of ethics say, you, that's Article uh, 16. Article 16 says you will not interfere with an exclusive right to sell listing or an exclusive buyer uh, representation. So you need to determine that. If you do, if you go to arbitration, you're going to lose. Right here, new share. Right. <clears throat> Number 19. See, the X is in the intro broker. And it talks about it here. So get a copy of this and make sure that you're comfortable with the information that's in here. Because it's necessary that you follow these things if you want. And it's, when I first saw this, I said, are you kidding me? This is the determination at the arbitration committee as to whether or not my agents are going to get paid. I made this part of my policy and procedures manual. You need a policy and procedures manual. You need something that says, these are how we do business with our, with our uh, company. And this is what we do here, 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 and here, and here. The, the California Association of Realtors puts out something called the Real Estate Office Policy Manual. It, it's kind of an outline, and you get to fill it in. It's admissible in a court of law as to what you've done to earn your commission and or protect yourself from lawsuits. So um, uh, if you go online, you'll never find it. You have to go to reps. REBS is a subsidiary of CAR called uh, Real Estate Business Services. And they, they have it there. It, it, CAR is not for profit. REBS is for profit. So they can sell stuff and make money. And then they give some money to CAR. <laughs> I don't know how that works. Anyway, you'll find this uh, policy procedure manual under REBS. You say, but I'm not the broker. Your broker should probably have a policy and procedures manual. Oh, they have one. It's written on the back of a bubblegum wrapper. Okay. So on the when I'm when I'm talking about the arbitration committee, <clears throat> this is what I'm talking about. Make sure that in here you have gone through the procuring cause chart. The information is available to you. All right. Now then, any questions? Let me see. We had a question here. Okay. Just for clarification, the attorney broker or the representative of the party does not have the right to address the panel. The, yes, that's correct. Or ask questions. Now, I know sometimes uh, I, I've been in situations where the broker is more eloquent than the complainant or the respondent. And so at that moment in time, rather than say, what did you say? What did you say? What did you say? I say, ask the question for them. But they are not to use attorneys, attorney bravado. I had one jump up and say, objection, your honor. I said, sit down, hot rod. It's not a court of law. I'm talking to the complainant, not to you. And that's the way you have to let them know uh, right off the bat, or they'll run over you like a train. <clears throat> so it, it's just a policy and procedure of that. In the manual, it says they are there either as, what do they call it? A non-legal represent, re representative is, um, they're like, uh, they're like, I don't know, a comfort dog. <laughs> that's the best I can put it there. They're there to make them feel better. You know, your broker's there or somebody's there to hold your hand. The attorney is there <clears throat> to tell you, hey, ask this question. They, they messed up. Make sure that they do this. They're not to, to direct the questions unless the panel says it's okay. Uh, I've, I've read too many reviews where the panel said it was okay and they lost total control of the hearing. 
and the and the attorney is arguing and stomping around the room and threatening and it's like wait a minute so that's that's the reason for that <clears throat> see if got any other questions all right so we went down here to questions now i told you i'm going to do two things number one <clears throat> i'm going to show you why you're here today now, if you've been in my classes before, you've seen this before, but if you haven't, then I want you to make sure you're cognizant of this. So I'm gonna leave all those going. I'm gonna to go to the California Association of Realtors website. Let me do a share screen here so everybody sees the process. You always know you're there because there's somebody sitting in the round chair. I don't know what the story is. Well, I do know what the story is, but we're not gonna go into it. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and sign in. Do we have enough usernames and passwords? If you need some extras, I got extras. So we get back to the person around here. Let's go to search and let's put in ethics bio lay. And let's search for that. It says code of ethics violators. So it says the California Association of Realtors in conjunction with the board bylaws that you signed that you never read says that if you are guilty of violation of the code of ethics, the board bylaws, or the MLS bylaws, you will not go on the hall of fame. You will go on the wall of shame. A delineation of what you did and your picture will be printed for others to see and other boards of realtors to see in on the California Association of Realtors website. Now, what I wanna do is, I don't wanna embarrass anybody here, but I wanna look at these different cases to find out, let's see, where was this, this article? This is Santa Clara, too close. Um, Riverside, nah, that's far away. All right, violation, found in violation of article 1, 9, and 11 of the Code of Ethics. As a result of that violation, <clears throat> Shift minus, see if that gets in. Control minus. No. Can't see the whole thing. It says in response to violations, we was reprimanded, placed in her file for three years. That's the letter. And find a thousand bucks. What the heck did she do? She looks like a nice lady. Represented to prospective purchasers of a property who were unmarried couple and Initially, both partners had planned to be on title of the property. Later on, Cruz told the partners that she would not be because the couple was not married. They could not be. According to the partner, Cruz told her that it would be added to the title in the transaction after closed. Despite being removed as a principal, Cruz continued to have the signer sign all the documents on the behalf of the partner in the transaction. <clears throat> after closing, Cruz told the partner she was no longer going to be an owner of the property and sent the partner a check for 1500 bucks, which Cruz called a finder's fee. Now, can you pay a commission to somebody who's unlicensed? No. Can you pay a finder's fee? Yes. It can't look like a commission. In the hearing, Cruz denied telling the partner that she wouldn't be on title, but she admitted that she allowed the partner to electronically sign documents related to the transaction. Cruz violated Article 1 by allowing the client to sign documents after she was no longer a party to the transaction. She also violated Article 9 because she didn't have a written document authorizing the signature. And also 11 because the services fail <coughs> standards, <coughs> standards of practice and competence expected on a buyer's agent. Okay, I can see Article 1, but 9 and 11 were like out of the blue to me. I was like, what? Uh, 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 so this is the kind of deliberations that are going to be made within the Professional Standards Committee. All right, let's take another one here. Uh, here's one. All right, <clears throat> Orange County was found in violation of 1911. Whoa, those seem to be a reoccurring theme. But look at the, the, the information here. As a result of these violations, letter of reprimand of 500 bucks was acting as a dual agent. We got any problems here? Now let's just make sure that we're clear on something. 
In the state of California, you can represent both buyer and seller as dual agents. The reason for that is most, but most of the United States, you can't. Most of the United States is under English common law, came over on the Mayflower, okay, 1620. We on the West Coast are under Spanish law. That comes from the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848. So we use deeds of trust, not mortgages. We can represent both buyer and seller as dual agents. Most of the United States, you cannot. So based on that, we have to be very careful here. We can represent both buyer and seller. And I, you know, when I go to the conventions, have my badge on, it says I'm from California. A guy from New York, he walks up to me, and says, are you kidding me? You're from California. How do you represent both buyer and seller? How can, I can only represent the buyer or the seller. I can only get paid by one. How can you get paid by both or for both? I say, well, I'm schizophrenic. Well, they all think we're crazy out here anyway. So in the real estate trend, representing both buyer and seller, they found that they were in violation of Article 1 because he failed to protect and promote the interests of the buyers. Remember, the first one through nine are duties to your clients and customers. Specifically, they failed to timely obtain and deliver the um, requisite disclosures from the buyer and failed to explain and advise uh, regarding the disclosures and failed to advocate repairs on the, back the, on the behalf of the buyer. And to uh, ensure and confirm the buyer and fail to explain uh, advising, okay, fail to explain <coughs> agreed upon repairs to be completed and fail to understand and explain the proper use of the real estate forms. Now, the only way that they're going to come up with this is the buyer testified. That was one of the okay, <clears throat> that came in. They also violated Article 9 in his incorrect use of forms during the transaction, including ambiguous license that failed to express the terms agreed to by the principals. Where did this come from? Didn't come from the buyers, didn't come from the sellers, it probably came from the agent. So the agent made up this language, put it in an agreement, uh, an addendum, had everybody sign it. And now when it was looked at, it was like, what does that mean? That's not clear. This is right on the edge of legal stuff. When you got to talk to the legal attorneys about this, it said uh, correct use of forms. It says also ultimately established led to the substantial amount of confusion and disagreement between the principals later on. Finally, in violation of Article 11, because they failed to complete the competent service as the buyer's agent. <clears throat> First of all, you need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. That's in your agency disclosure. It's the first thing underneath both buyer and seller. So if you're not able to explain the forms, you're in trouble right away. I told you under the real estate purchase agreement, let's go to a new share here. Under this real estate purchase agreement, in all the years that I've been doing real estate, I have never seen these words. It says right here, um, when you're, um, if you're going to stay in the property after the close, called an SIP, seller in possession. Let me find my SIP here. If you have an SIP, seller in possession, <clears throat> this is just a rental policy where the seller stays in the property after it's closed. You have to have a rental policy. You have to make sure your insurance is taken care of. But if we look at 7C, 7C, it says right here, seller remain in possession. The buyer is to consult with a qualified real estate attorney. In the 40 years I've been doing this business, I have never seen those words in our real estate purchase contract. It's in here three times. Three times it says, you, buyers and sellers, are to consult a qualified, whatever that is, California real estate attorney. It's getting interesting out there. So when we go back and we talk about some of the violations <clears throat> that are out there, you need to be competent. So now we're taking that comp 
I don't even know what the word is. We're taking that competentiality out of the equation by putting an attorney in there. I think what we're going to do is we're going to find ourselves in a big mess, okay? Because the attorneys are going to get involved in this. You know, attorneys have to work from a logical standpoint. There is nothing logical about the price of real property in the state of California. It is crazy. It's ludicrous. But there it is. So as soon as the attorneys get a hold of this, they're going to go, well, you shouldn't buy this property. This is crazy. All right. <clears throat> Let's move down here a little bit. Uh, I had another one here. Oh, here we go. Peter Pack West found in violation of Article 1. As a result of the violation, given a warning placed in 500 bucks. Look at this, 500 bucks just for one violation. Article 1. And it says, when preparing buyers for residential, they requested a home inspection. Just before, and I love reviewing these from this aspect. When I'm sitting on a professional standards, I can go, oh, this is starting to sound like that one I reviewed. How did they find? Well, they found this and they found that. Now I can be more cognizant when we're sitting, you know, when the when the, the respondent and the complainant are gone and the three the three of us are sitting down there and we're saying, what's our finding of facts and what's our what's our recommendation? I can look back on these and say, okay, this is where they were. And each one of these was a decision made in California. It was given to the National Association of Realtors. And if enough happened, it becomes a standard of practice underneath your code of ethics. <clears throat> so let me come over here. Go here. I want to show you. I just want to make sure. Code of ethics. There it is. All right. So we'll make that a little bit bigger and share screen all right so here's our code of ethics as of 2022 we'll make it a little bit bigger to see some of the things that are of interest changey poos in this preamble under all is the land one through nine or dues your clients and customers to the public 10 through 14 and realtors in article one one dash seven it is in our purchase agreement. And it says, when acting as a broker, and we're good actors and actresses, shall continue to submit offers as long as until closing or execution of the lease waived by or obligation in writing. <clears throat> by law, in the state of California, do you have to submit all offers? Yes. How long do you have to submit them for? Until close of escrow. So this is just a reiteration of our law. But this was written by the National Association of Realtors. Okay, I got that. Upon written request, here it is, the cooperating broker who submitted the offer and the listing broker shall provide in writing confirmation to the cooperating broker that they submitted it to the seller and they, because they have an obligation to submit that. This is in your code of ethics. You must, if I, representing the buyer, say, prove listing agent you submitted your offer, not only in your code of ethics, do you have to do that? But it's law in the state of California. So if we look at our purchase agreement, come back here to our purchase agreement, share this. <coughs> Let's go back up here. So here's our real estate purchase agreement. And on page 16, which is our signature page as agents, on page 16, it says, this is the broker's page. It says, number one, real estate brokers are not parties to this agreement. You're not to make decisions on the behalf of them. And it says right here, presentation of offers. Pursuant to the National Association of Realtors, Standard Practice 1-7, if the buyer's agent makes a written request, the seller's agent must confirm in writing that they presented the offer to the seller. Now, where this is coming from is as dual agents. I put this on the MLS and I get five calls from buyers that say, I want you to represent us, thinking I'll get them a better deal. And I'm going, wow, I get both ends of the commission. So I tell a seller, da, 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 da. now another offer comes in. It's for $200,000 more. It's a better offer. But I, as the agent, don't show it. That's a violation of law, number one. Number two, it's a violation of your code of ethics. Now, 
at the list, the buyer's agent sends me a letter or sends me an email saying, hi, prove that this was signed. Prove that you showed this to them. There's only two ways they can do that. Number one, they can get their initials of the seller right here. It's a, now we're a kinder, gentler purchase agreement. So it doesn't say offer or rejected. It says offer not accepted and the initial. Or down here where it says the agent says, I did present the offer on this date at this time. And you can get the seller's initials here too. That's the written confirmation. Here's what I project will happen. The agent will take it back to the seller and say, hi, I need your initials here. Uh, the, buy, the buyer, another buyer said, we didn't present the offer. So I have to get your initials to show that we did present it. Seller's going to say, what's the offer? Oh, well, it's for $200,000 more than what you accepted. Wow. Do you think it's going to hit the fan? <laughs> now, if in fact they don't get the seller's initials, but the initial down here, the agent initials down here, and it's a lie, they're perjuring themselves. If in fact it goes to court, that agent's done. They're gone, their license is gone and they're going to be up to civil suits. <clears throat> so the idea behind Article 7, uh, Article 1-7 is, hey, present all offers as the law tells you to. Number two, confirm it. Now, uh, I teach the contracts class, so I want to know, I want you to know, this is below the agent's signature. They don't have to initial it. This is below the seller's signature. They don't have to initial it. Nothing under law says they must initial it. This is just being polite. And my office policy is we present the offer, they rejected it, we feel initial here. We just have them initial. It's just a, a gimme. They don't have to by law. And then I show this to the other agent. And the other agent, and if you look at the definition of an agent, that's the broker. I don't have to initial here because it's underneath my signature. My signature is up here. This is the broker's firm up here. I don't have to initial this. But if requested, I have to prove. I have to put in writing. The only way I know to do that is to initial here. So it's bringing up some interesting things. And I think we're going to see more of this as we go along here as agents get more and more greedy. So, representing both, um, the, the listing price agent told that he could, uh, a stranger access the occupied property without a background check. Uh, the listing agent had to arrange the for a licensed agent to be able to stay for the buyer's inspection. And he didn't think it was his responsibility, the agent's responsibility, to be there for the home inspection or compensate a listing agent for that. The panel found that they had violated Article 1 because he did not protect and promote the buyer's interest by failing to be present during the home inspection and making other inspections. Now, I, my office policy is you don't have to be there for the home inspection. I'm reading this and going, Oops, they think you should be because why? The person that's in there is unlicensed. Your listing agreement says you will have licensed agents show the property in there at all times. Uh, it's the little things that will put you out of this business, not the big things. It's the little things. So now, office policy change. If there's a home inspection, the a licensee must be present, <clears throat> preferably the listing agent, because of this kind of stuff. And again, what I like to do with this is I like to read it and go, are you kidding me? I don't even do this. If I was called before, I'd be guilty right now. There's, it's little things. It's not big things in this business. Come down here to, let's see. What was the other one? Yeah, if you if you don't give them the picture, they'll take the picture for you. <laughs> and they, they stay on there for three years. <clears throat> so your, your picture going to be on for three years. Let me see. Ah, here we go. Um, found a violation of Article 1, 9, and, 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 uh, 1, 9, and 11. I, I, this seems to be a reoccurring theme. 
but you, you got to understand these articles, they're not just like, hi, you won't do this. Their standards of practice underneath it. And so they might refer to the standard of practice. Stephanie represented the client in the sale of a house and subsequent uh, purchase of an investment property. She did not provide the details in writing com compliant to or correct or keep records of accounting for the work that was done on the investment property after the close. Now, I'm sure there's more details here, and there might be a violation of trust fund handling, 10145 of the Business and Professions Code. This is a there's a whole treatise of this in the Commissioner's Code of Ethics, as well as in our, our Code of Ethics. <clears throat> so uh, let me see here. Failed to oversee the move out of the previous tenants and move in of the new tenants. Furthermore, she failed to keep her client who lives out of state adequately informed about the management of the, of the property. Now, again, my office, Paul, there's too much liability in property management and trust funds, trust fund handling, because you have to have a trust fund account. I do not allow trust fund. We don't do property management at MJC Realty. So this is totally out of my purview. But what it said was this. She did not adequately inform the management or other investment prop of the other investment property. She had nothing to do with the management, but she didn't keep the management company in the loop. Oh, geez. This was a $2,500 one right here. So after repeatedly written requests from the client, Stephanie also borrowed from her client during this listing period with the promise to pay it back close of escrow. Uh, I don't know why that's even in here, unless it was trust money. She never repaid it. Oh, well, now we know what happened. She borrowed money, didn't repay it. The panel found that she failed to protect and promote the client's interest and failed to provide competent services and therefore violated Articles 9 and 11. Additionally, the panel found the performance of the acts as a property manager without a written property management agreement. Uh-oh. So here it comes out. From everything else, I didn't know she was the property manager. I didn't know she took that deal on. Number one, she has to have permission from her broker and to get, pro to get errors, and errors and emissions on property management is very hard. Number two, she didn't know what she's doing. She didn't, she didn't have an agreement which led the client to a liability and misunderstanding of what was expected. Also, she did not provide copies of fully executed lease agreements. And after the client made several attempts to get copies of them, <clears throat> and when the client did receive copies, they were not fully executed. That means they weren't signed. <laughs> that means she took out zip forms, piped it up, and sent it to them. Not a valid contract. State of California has got to be signed <laughs> and copies distributed. But we're not talking law here, but we're just talking violations. You know, there might be other legal ramifications later on, but somebody has to pursue that. This is just code of ethics. Stephanie was found in violation because she failed to make sure that all the necessary agreements were in writing. That's law of copy. I mean, that's law. <laughs> and they provide executed copies of the agreement, signed copies. Article one, the duty to protect, promote. Nine, a duty to make sure all agreements are in writing and signatory. Ooh and 11 provide competent service. It's the little things that will put you out of this business, not the big things. So I, I love reviewing these just from the aspect of, oops, that sounds like me, to, oh, if I'm on a panel, they came up with this, I wouldn't have thought of that. I'm going to have to look deeper or talk to my other panel members a little more clearly. All right, no questions, no comments. If anybody's on here, uh, let me know so I don't uh, bring you out as an example. It's out the Riverside board, $10,000. Uh, I think you've been before the committee many times to have a $10,000 fine. One, two, six, nine, 11, 12, 97. Represented comp, uh, complainants in a case. So the complainants, were actually the public in this instance. They wished to sell her home and purchase new one, violated articles 11 by breaching the fiduciary duty and failing to provide competent service because he forged, uh, 
Why are we even looking at this? If there's a forgery, that's a violation of law. That needs to be turned over to the authorities. Well, if nobody's gonna, if nobody's gonna complain, the authorities don't get involved. So now they complain to the, the association. The association got involved on the transaction documents as well as loan documents. Oh man! Now wait a minute. If you uh, purchase agreements, that's state of California. Loan docs, that's the feds. Do you know who comes knocking on the door if you violate federal law? <laughs> FBI, Agent Scully, or Mulder. I don't know. I don't want to hear the knock. You need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you're dealing and not pull this kind of shenanigans. So he created and allowed to be created false emails, failed to provide copies, failed to inform the clients of the down payment, failed to... Why is this person even licensed? Oh, wait a minute. They were put on the MLO uh, because he claimed to have a valid MLO. And now the DRE says there's no MLO active. It's inactive. <clears throat> so that's why the 10,000. <laughs> you ain't getting it, Hot Rod. What's the maximum? 15. Right on the edge there. So it's these kinds of things. Um, Here's one, Sharon, Silicon Valley, 5,000. Um, made an agreement with a non-licensee to attempt to purchase property at an auction. Well, a, a person doesn't have to have a license to buy real property. Let, let's make sure you're, we're clear on this. Do you have to be a citizen of the United States to own property here? No. Do you have to have a green card? To own real property in the United States? No. Do you have to have a social security number? No. Do you have to be over the age of 18 to own real property in the United States? No. That's the Jackie Coogan case. The child star in Hollywood, his, par his parents were stealing all his money. The guardian put all his stuff into real estate. He couldn't sell it. So the parents couldn't get the money until he was 18. He could make his own decisions. So you can own real property under the age of 18. You just can't sell it. So with that in mind, ultimately was uh, evicted, uh, complainant, concealed to con condition of the property for the insurance agent. Whew, that's another one. You're, you're fooling with the insurance companies. They have their own investigators and they got no sense of humor. Ultimately was convicted of the complainant uh, property and sold the property, netting approximately $100,000. The panelists found that they were acting as the complainant's agent and violated 1 in 11 because she failed to protect the promote her client's interest and failed to pro provide the clients with competent service. Remember, that's the first that you need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. That's why when somebody says to me, well, I, I, I can fill out this. 16 page purchase agreement, no problem. That scares me to death because the only place you fill out is the first three pages. There's no other place on the purchase agreement you fill out anything. She violated Article 2. She directed Article 2 and directed the complaint to misrepresent pertinent facts about the property to the insurance company. Now, I got to tell you, it's tough to get insurance now in the state of California because California has made it un, unprofitable for insurance companies. However, the last thing you want to do is misrepresent to an insurance company because that null and void the insurance. And if there's any claim, they ain't getting paid. And the, the, the lender is going to be real excited about that. Finally, they violated Article 9 to provide correct paperwork throughout the process. So, Article 1, duty to protect. Article 2, duty of misrepresentation. Article 9, duty to make sure all agreements were expressed in terms that were clear and understandable language. That's a good one. Everybody always says, well, it's got to be clear and understandable language. That's what it says in our... <laughs> oh, let's make sure we know. I want to go back to it. And we'll come back to this in a minute here. In your purchase agreement, the real estate purchase agreement, <clears throat> who wrote up this form? Who wrote up this California purchase agreement escrow instructions? 
Not who filled it in, I filled it in. Who wrote up this form? No, not attorneys. It was, it was put together by realtors such as yourself. It's a, it's a committee called Standard Forms. I served on it in the 1980s when the purchase agreement went from two pages to four. I said, nobody will sign this damn thing. We now have a 16-page purchase agreement. See, one of 16. And they tell you, don't practice law. This was put together by realtors such as yourself. It was then given to legal staff at CAR to make sure it's admissible in a court of law. So when we're looking at this, don't be mad at attorneys, be mad at yourself. You need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. You need to read this over several times. You need to understand them, how to explain it to your buyers and sellers, and you can't circumvent this stuff. After page uh, three, there's no places to put anything on here except initials. <sighs> you need to explain these different things in here because they're ultimately part of the law and part of your code of ethics. All right, new share. Uh, uh, uh. All right, we're back here. So understandable language. <clears throat> now, that purchase agreement is an understandable language. My question, it says in there, it's understandable language. My question is, what language is that? You say English. No, this we don't speak English. We don't write English. I've been to England. They speak English and write English there. You say, oh, American. Okay. North American, Central American, or South American. They're all Americans. So here's what I've determined is an understandable language. This is the language that we speak in the United States. Americanski. Do you know how I determined that? Because in 1963, Kusha, the president of Russia took his shoe off and beat it on the podium at the UN and said, I will bury you, Americanskis. He was talking about the United States of America. So I believe we speak a specific language to the United States of America. And it ain't English. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. So, and, and when I was on standard forms, our, our treatise was, or our uh, we were told we have to write the contracts so they're understandable by a ninth grader. Now, I don't know how we determine that. I don't know what the preams are now. I, I quit standard forms long ago when it went to six pages. I said, you guys are all out of your ever loving. I'm done with it. Now it's up to 16. And I know they're passing around the wacky tobacco on that deal. Anyway, so, and also article and provide competent service. So we can see just by reviewing these that there are, there are several things that are totally obvious. And then there's other things that are very subtle. It's only a $200 fine. It's only a $500 fine. I, you know, I would pay $15,000 not to have my picture here. Okay. So if you don't want your picture on the hall of shame, or the wall of shame, the hall of fame is something different, then you need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. Don't get into these situations. Know the code of ethics. And I applaud you for being here today because you have taken the steps to make sure that you are a leader in your particular association and not part of the problem that we get into a lot of times here. So, let me see if there's any questions. We had, a, we had a question here. Good, good, good. So it says, uh, uh, uh. I feel Article 11 gets overused because of the provide competent service. I do not feel this necessarily means the agent made a mistake. I interpret the article to mean uh, providing the real estate service outside the, oh, you hit it right on the head. You need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. Oh, well, I'm, I'm knowledgeable in residential properties. Then you need to know what the rules and regs are of residential property, state of California. You need to know what the city says, the state says, and you need to be able to interpret the forms. You are absolutely right. So what happens is Article 11 is overused because they say you need to be knowledgeable. They've taken, they three times they took this out of our new contract by saying qualified real estate attorney. They've said, no, no, take this out of our court, put it into the court of the people who are attorneys. If the buyer has a question, ask them, not us. 
So I agree with you 100%. And, but the problem is, this is not fun and games anymore. This is not sitting in open house on Sundays once, once a month. This is serious stuff. And you need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you deal. Based on that, I'm going to show you one more thing. We go to uh, the California Association of Realtors website. So we'll just come back here. We'll go back in your in here. You know, you go back to person with the chair. If you go to Transaction Center, well, we don't even have to go to Transaction Center. We can go right here. This is where you go to zip forms. All right. So in our, oh yeah, you got to make sure you pay your dues. Can you imagine you're sitting in front of your clients and this does not light up? How embarrassing is that? You click on continue. It takes you into Zipforms Plus. Now, Zipforms Plus is, is web-based. If you cannot get an internet connection, you're not going to get connected to here. I was using or showing you, this is called Zipforms Standard. Wait a minute, let me get, make sure that you're seeing this. This is called Zipforms Standard. I do not have to be connected to the internet to use this. I use this in class because I can make it bigger. It's easier to see. It, it is a contract, just like any other. <clears throat> and it, it talks about um, all, as a matter of fact, every contract, all over, over 250, there's 250 forms now. The real estate trends possible in the real estate transaction. These are all the different forms. This is 2022. So they're all there. I don't have to know all of them, but I have to be able to explain the real estate purchase agreement. Now, um, part, part of my point on in this is that there are certain disclosures you, make, you must make by law. And here's where I found them. I went back to the California Association of Realtors website. So we're here at the California Association of Realtors website. You always know you're there because the person's sitting in the chair. We can go back for that. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> okay. Person sitting in the chair. Here's what I did. About 12 years ago, I was just mousing around in here. I was just looking at stuff, trying to figure out how the how's this business going? I clicked on Transaction Center. It gave me a whole new set of tabs. Remember, I came over here to risk management. Risk management is a big deal to us as real estate professionals. I clicked on this. It talks about the RPA, COVID. And I came down here to the bottom <clears throat> where it says sales disclosure chart. And I clicked on that. Sales disclosure chart. This chart was put together by Member Legal Services, area code 213-739-8282. I'm at the California Association of Realtors. This chart is broken up into four areas. One to four residential units are the first three columns. These are all the disclosures required by law in the state of California. If you're selling apartments, here's the column, all the disclosures. Commercial, here's the column. Mobile homes, the, the actual form and the law that says you must provide that disclosure. Fifty disclosures, of which forty-two are required by law. If we got together as a group, we couldn't come up with forty. You know how I figured that out? I counted the yes. I took this first column and I just counted the yeses. Forty-two. That's unbelievable to me. You need to be knowledgeable in the area in which you're dealing. If you're not, then shift the risk to somebody who is or get the knowledge. And I teach a class on the 40 plus standard disclosures in the sale of a single family home. I just counted the yeses. That's all I did in this first column. And, and the first column says, if it is a standard sale, whatever that is, okay. doesn't have anything to do with trust bankruptcy or foreclosures. I think they're gonna see some of those coming up. So. Uh, let me see if we got any other questions. I really appreciate that question. They, they are putting stuff on us now and it, it gets, gets, 11 gets thrown on us like we're supposed to be the end all to beat all. Well, we got to have some knowledge or know where to get it. And that's why I showed you this. So if you say, I don't have any clue what these 40 are, I'm with you. <laughs> I can't remember what they are, but I teach the class and I've researched all of these to see where did this come from? 
Where, where did the fact that you've got to have uh, advisability to title insurance? If there's no title insurance issued, you have to advise them. It's typically done by escrow. This is handled by escrow. If there's no escrow involved, then we're, we're in. This is so off the wall, we don't even have a form for it. <sighs> All right. So with that in mind, any other questions, comments, reactions? Nothing in the chat. Nothing in the security. All right. Well, by the powers vested in me of the California Association of Realtors, you have now completed your required every two years course on professional standards. And I'm serious. If you do have any questions, I want you to get in touch with me. If you have any comments, you know, get in touch with me because I want you, I want you comfortable in the volunteer positions that you've taken. Uh, the only person attending the class is getting paid should have been Wendy because <laughs> we're all volunteers here. And I'm happy to answer any of your questions. There's my email address and I even take texts. Any other questions? No, Joe, we're, we're done. We, we're, we're stick a fork in this. We're out of here. Okay. You've been a good group. In the words of a real estate, a famous real estate attorney, go out there and sell something. I need the money. See you in the next class. Bye-bye, y'all.